Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. What if Naruto was the second husband of cute albedo? Movie. In the game of Yggdrasil there existed tens of thousands of guilds. The number of members ranged from dozens to thousands. The guild that stood at the top of the charts happened to be one of the smaller guilds with several world-class items at their disposal. The guild of Ainzul Gaon with only 42 members in their guild was easily a force of pure controlled malice. The guild of being so evil that guilds across the server had an open bounty on all the members of Ainzul Gaon. Lead by the Three Kings of Hate, the guild Ainzul Gaon waged a war against all human races of the Yggdrasil. Ainzul Gaon had been called unbeatable. Their guild base, the Great Tomb of Nazar, ten floors made impenetrable with even an eight guild alliance, only being able to make it past the seventh floor. On the eighth floor of Nazark was the true headquarters of the guild, with the main meeting room of the guild being adorned with the personal flags of each of the 43 members of the guild. Currently only three members of the guild were present. Although the third was just passing though, the guild master of Ainzul Gaon, Momoga. Momoga if you asked her an earl didn't think that she was beautiful, but average at best. In Yggdrasil however she made herself a beautiful wrath sorceress. Standing at 510 she was the shortest of all the female members of the Ainzul Gaon. She was cool busty and curvy with a slender and toned stomach and mild long legs, knee-length death white hair, blazing red eyes, a tattoo in the middle of her forehead, wearing an armor bone bikini that was made from the skeleton of an abysmal one, with the bikini bottom having a large red gem in the crotch area, knee-high white high-heeled boots, more because they made her feel white than anything, elaborate jet black academic gown adorned with golden and violet edges, several rings on her fingers that augmented her already formidable magic power, and a necklace that had special meaning to her within the game. 1. The frontline commander Yuzukic, and he was tall in his human form standing at 6'4 with muscles that showed that he wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty, violet eyes, 3 whisker-like marks on each cheek, and a pair of finnick fox ears on top of his head, a single fluffy fox tail patterned it from his tailbone, wearing a red short sleeve flaming Hayori, the orange and black sleeveless kimono black pants, boots. Around his neck was a green gem with 9 larger black orbs around it. Finally a member of the guild who hadn't been present in almost a year. A slime by the name of Hair Hair a purple slime monster that was formerly part of Ain Zul Gaon's strategy team. If he had come in full armor he would look like a hulking golem. Together these three were the remnants of Ain Zul Gaon in the final hours of the game. It's good to see you after so long Hair Hair Khan. Said an excited Mamuga. Yuzukic nodded and tried to keep the smile off his face. He and Hair Hair had often worked closely together. Yeah. Almost a year since you were a fully active member Hair Hair. Really that long huh? Can't say I'm surprised. Ever since I became middle management my days have bleed together, said Hair Hair. I know the feeling. Remember I'm a salary woman myself unlike someone standing here at the moment, joked Momoga. Izukic gave Momoga a playful glare. Just because I have a bit of cash doesn't mean anything. Remember I still have to actively run my company otherwise the board will put Blue Planet in a bind, said Izukic. Out of everyone in the guild Izukic was the only one who actively knew three other members in Earl. Blue Planet just happened to be one of them. Hair Hair chuckled. I see you two are still the married couple of the guild, said Hare Harrow, happy to see his friends still being so happy. As if I would marry this fleabag hag. Yelled the two as they glared at each other. Hare Harrow looked around the hole. I still can't believe that the two of you managed to keep this entire place running, and in such good content and for all this time, yawned Hare Harrow. Are you alright Hare Harrow Khan? Asked Yuzukic. Yes. I just haven't gotten much sleep lately my friend. It was a good eight years. I'm just sorry that I couldn't be here longer, said Hare Harrow. Momoga nodded to her friend. I'm glad you were able to at least make it here. Many of the others declined it or didn't even answer my email, said Momoga. Hair Hero nodded to this. I was sure that Peror and Sino would have come. He had the biggest crush on you, said Hair Hero. On her avatar maybe, groaned out Yuzukic making the other two laugh. Peror and Sino had been part of the guild's perverted trio alongside White Brim and Tabur. Between the three of them they had some of the kinkiest annual NPCs in Nazark. Hair Hero looked around one last time. We had some great times here. I'll see you two around. Hopefully in another game, said Hare Hero. Before either Yuzuki or Momoga could say anything Hare Hero logged off. Damn it. Cried Momo, no Suzuki Sana. The woman behind Momoga and she slammed her fist into the polished marble, putting a large creak in it. Izuka, Yuzumaki Naruto got up from his seat and walked over to Sana, and gently took her hand. It's alright Sana. We both knew this was coming, said Naruto. It's not fair. Said the woman as white hot tears began to leave her eyes. We pour our blood, sweat, tears, ideas, and ideas into this place. How could they just abandon it? Abandon you as to be alone. Naruto gently pulled the woman into a hug as he allowed her to cry. It wasn't like he couldn't understand her. No in fact it was the opposite. He agreed with her 100% but knew that Ainzul Gaon was always a doomed organization because of its two founding rules. 1. You had to be a working member of society. 2. You had to have a heteromorphic race. The second rule wasn't important. It was the first rule that a doomed dog. As a working member of society several member of Ains followed their dreams. 
the Kubika Chikuma had become a renowned voice actress and was in high demand across the industry. She ended up leaving the game three years ago. Yumiko had become a high school teacher. Tachmi made the biggest jump of them all and became a politician. There was even a time where it looked like Naruto was going to end up leaving the game for several years. It was only thanks to a major breakthrough and smart finical choices that he was able to keep on playing the game. All 42 members of Ain's Gown had hopes and dreams outside of the game. Or at least that was what was on the surface. I took Naruto and Sana had come to learn many a thing about each other's that made them become closer over the last year, where they were the only active daily members of Ain's Gown. It took another 5 minutes for Sana to calm down from her fit. Once she did she wiped her eyes. As a rule between when the other was in an emotional place, they dropped all pretense of their characters and became themselves. Despi Uzumaki Naruto CEO of Yuzu Industries, one of the founding father companies of the Deep Dive System and Suzuki Sana, a woman with a degree in business management, and stuck at a dead-end job as a team lead. To forgive me Yuzukich for that shameful display of weakness, said Sana slipping back into her character of Momoga. It's fine Momoga. So shall we take a stroll to the throne room? Asked Yuzukich. Momoga nodded. For this I think I'll bring the staff of Ain Zulgaon. Momoga held out her hand and summoned the staff to her. It was a Riculum twisted staff with seven serpent heads and seven different elemental colored gems held in their mouths. Momoga took a step forward, and once she was three steps ahead Yuzukich fell in a step behind her. Once in the hall they saw the Paldi's battle maids and the head butler of Nazark. It's a shame they never got to see battle, said Naruto. My thoughts exactly. It would be a shame if they never left that place. Follow, said Momoga. In no time that all the group arrived at the throne room where the ornate throne of Ainzu Gown stood tall and proud. Not only one person had ever sat upon it Momoga, a testament to their strength as a guild, as a team, as a family. Momoga sat down with Yuzukich taking a step to her left. Standing before the throne was the overseer NPC. One of Tabula's creations. Albedo impeccable beauty, Albedo is a woman with lustrous jet black hair and the face of a goddess. She has golden air eyes and vertically split pupils, on her left and right temples are two thick horns protruding crookedly, and on her waist are a pair of black angel wings. Wearing a pure white dress with silky gloves covering her slender hands and a golden spiderweb necklace that covers her shoulders and chest. Neil, said Yuzukich. All the NPCs bent to the knee before the serpent beings. You know I always wondered about Albedo's settings, said Momoga as she raised the staff and opened Albedo's settings. What the hell tabula? Said Yuzukich as they read her bio. Momoga's sweat dropped. He always did love his contradictions, said Momoga as she got to the last line of text. On the outside, she is a perfect beauty. On the inside, she's a bitch. Naruto took a step back as Momoga's eye twitched. Tabula you ing perverted cuck. Yelled Momoga. Why did you ruin beautiful albedo with such an evil bio? If I ever see you again he'll cut your ing dick off, roast it slow on an open grill, and then force feed it to you as I make sweet sweet love to albedo. Despite the way she talked about the perverted trio Sana herself was fairly on the kicky side, since she had told Naruto during a raid on a succubus den, that she was by. Naruto accepted it and even figured that her first meaningful relationship was with a woman. It should have also been a big hint that she was a pervert because the mega perverted pro Arsino was Sana Momoga best friend. Naruto Yuzuki had learned this when he had seen the perverted trio and Momoga going over the setting of Sheltier's harem. But they had used their own resources in this fashion, so it was up to them how they dealt with it. Although Naruto himself would admit that the vampire brides were quite lovely, not as lovely as his demon Kinoichi or his personal NPC, but they were pretty close. To feel better? Asked Yuzuki sweat dropping at the woman. No. I'm going to chance her setting to something more apparate, said Momoga. As she brought up the settings using the admin powers of the staff, Naruto raised a brow at this. Rule 6. Do you oppose? Asked Momoga looking to her comrade. Yuzuki shook his head. Not really. I just think if you change her at least keep her original programming somewhat intact, said Yuzukich. Very well then, said Momoga. Is madly in love with both Momoga and Yuzukich. Well it seems that she has a hard time choosing between the two she knows in her heart of hearts, that both would accept her and each other, should the chose ever come up. Careful Sana-chan that sounds a bit like a love letter, teased Naruto. Sana had the decency to blush. I'm just adding a touch of dramatic flair Naruto-kan don't worry, said Sana. Before another word could be said both players noticed a timer appear in in the edge of their visions. 30 seconds till server shut down. Naruto took Sana's hand in his own. It's going to be hard to see this place go, said Naruto. Sana nodded. I know it is, said Sana. 20 seconds till server shut down. I'll look for a link to another gay man send it to you, said Naruto. Sana nodded. She thought about it for a second, before reaching up and kissing Naruto on the cheek. I'll see you soon K. 10 seconds till server shut down. You know, if it's not too much trouble I'd like to see you Earl, said Naruto. Sana smiled. That sounds like fun. Shoot me an email and we'll cook something up, said Sana. Naruto smiled. 
It's a date sana sen. 1159 in 58 seconds. 1159 in 59 seconds. 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock in 1 second. 12 o'clock in 2 seconds. 12 o'clock in 3 seconds. Did they delay the server shutdown? Asked Yuzukic, but in a voice that was deeper and stronger than his normal voice. Perhaps they did, said Momoga her voice more sensual with a hint of a lustful undertone. Momoga-sama, Yuzukic-sama. Came a voice that neither of them had ever heard before. A beautiful that tickled the ear and promised things to not only your heart, but your very soul. Both Yuzukic and Momoga looked at Albedo who had a look of confusion on her face. Is there a problem my lord and lady? Asked Albedo tilting her head in confusion. What the hell was going on? 0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
What was that, Sana? Asked Naruto, rounding on his friend. I have no idea what you're talking about, said Sana as she was about to walk out of the tunnel. Naruto grabbed her by her arm and pushed her into the wall, before slamming his arm next to her blocking her escape. Sana frowned. Why is what I did such a problem? Asked Sana. Because there were other ways to test out if we were still in the game. Something as simple as grabbing her hand would have worked. Not to mention how we basically Yuli assaulted Albedo, said Yuzukich. Momoga crossed her arms under her breasts. Maybe I did take it a bit far. But something as simple as grabbing her wouldn't have been enough to know for sure, said Sana. Bullshit. Growled Naruto. Momoga glared into her friend's eyes. No, it wouldn't have. Least you forget that Yggdrasil treats hand grabs as a form of combat, unless a genital is targeted. Kissing, groping, the fact that Albedo had two orgasms within moments of my kiss and your touch gave us all the information that we needed to know, said Sana before she smirked. Besides, you played with her ass, bitter neck. What's that called again? Mate marking. Naruto frowned, before he backed away. While he didn't 100% agree he did have to admit that he went even further than she did. He had groped Albedo. Something he would have chewed any of his subordinates out about. He would have to be far more careful going forward. You're right. I'm sorry about that Sana, said Naruto. Don't worry about it. I should have checked with you before I did what I did. Anyway we need to speak with the twins, said Sana. Also I don't think I forgot the fact you never gave me an answer to my question. The duo exited the corridor and made their way to the arena. The Coliseum that paid homage to the Roman Coliseum that was constructed during the time of Roman Emperor Vespasian. It sat in the middle of a small desert, but as you got further out you could see the vast forest that surrounded the sixth floor. Blue Planet's pet project. I always forget how breathtaking this place is, said Yuzukich. Yes. It's hard to believe that it's completely underground, said Momoga. Apart from that where are the twins? Asked Yuzukich sama Over here. Yelled a voice from the Emperor's booth. The figure jumped down and ran over to the duo. It was a young dark elf. Even though both knew that it was a girl you'd be hard pressed to know that at first glance. Or a Debbie Fior. A dark elf. Yuzukich was sure that she would grow up to be a heartbreaker when she was fully grown. Golden hair and heterochromia, her left eye blue and right eye green. She wears reddish black dragon scale leather covered by a white and gold vest, embroidered with the guild emblem of Ainzul gown. Below it, she has a matching set of white trousers and gold plated shoes, and around her neck is an acorn necklace emitting golden light. 2. She quickly bowed to the duo. Momoga Sama, the most beautiful woman in all of Nazar and Yuzukich Sama, a man who all men bow to. I welcome you to the sixth floor, said Or. Momoga let out a quick chuckle. My that is quite the elaborate introduction Or, but I must ask you where is your brother? Asked Momoga with a hint of playfulness in her red eyes. Or looked around and frowned. Mare get over here. Yelled Or. Nichan I can't it's scary. Yelled a voice. Get over here. You're being rude to Momoga Sama and Yuzukich Sam. Yelled Or. Another figure jumped out of the Emperor's box, but landed on their butt, they quickly got up and ran over. This time it was a young boy. Or Belfior. He looked just like Or, but insisted of wild hair, his was shaped in a short style bob cut, blue dragon scale shirt, white vest like his sister's, but instead of a shirt he wore a skirt, stockings and boots. In his hands was a twisted black staff. Yubibuku's children, thought Yuzukich before sweat dropping. I forgot how much she likes her traps. It's so good to see you Lady Momoga, Lord Yuzukich. Forgive my earlier rudeness, said Mare. Momoga gave a small laugh. All is forgiven. I actually came down here for two reasons. One is to shake off the rust I accumulated sitting on my throne. The other is because in just under 20 minutes the other guardians will be here, said Momoga. Or his ears dropped. Does that mean that Sheltier will be here as well? Asked Or. Of course she will. Please try and be civil with her Or, said Yuzukich smiling at the young dark elf. Or sighed, before she ordered some of her myoins to bring out targets for Momoga. Naruto stood against the wall and watched as Momoga unleashed a few spells before summoning a fire elemental. Or and Mare then went to work destroying the elemental with ease. During the fight Naruto's senses picked up a faint aura appearing. Demon Shinobi Commander Onijiri. I don't remember summoning you here, especially when Nazirk is on a level 4 alert, said Yuzukich in annoyance. The figure appeared kneeling behind Naruto and in the shadows. He was covered in shadows with the only visible light being his yellow eyes. Forgive me my lord. I wouldn't have come here from the 9th if it wasn't important it has to do with what is going on outside of Nazirk, said the shadow. I'm sure Sabas was going to give us the information needed. Why have you come to me on a matter that I would have known about in a few moments? Asked Yuzukich. This is a separate matter from the one you had Lord Sabas look into, said Onijiri. Now that caught Yuzukich's ear. Well he did give Sabas orders Demon Shadow was part of a group of NPCs that Naruto had created and personally controlled. During their creation the rest of Ain Zulgaon feared the Demon Shinobis, since they could move though most of Nazar detected, except by a few individuals like the bosses, floor guardians, and supreme beings. An intelligence assassination force. 50 NPCs all at the level of 70, with only the commander and vice commander being higher and level 80. They lived in the 8th floor, the wilderness. 
Nazrix most deadly zone with a job that required them to be there. Protect Oriole Omega in the Cherry Blossom Sanctuary. What is it that you have to report to me, Commander? Asked Naruto. Well, I won't give the details that Sabasama is going to report. I will say that currently I have four squads investigating a total of 10 miles out in all directions. They are recording information and creating a map of the area, said the commander. Yuzuki nodded. Report back to me once all of the squads have returned. Also once they return start expanding outwards until we have 100 miles mapped in all directions, said Naruto as he kicked off the wall. But you will Yuzuki-sama, said Onijiri vanishing back into the shadows. Yuzuki walked over as a gateway opened up and out walked the floor guardian of the one to three floors, sheltier bloodful. A buxom vampire. Described as a true beauty, she has pale shiny skin, seductive crimson red eyes, and fine facial features. Sheltier's silver hair is tied in a ponytail through a large ribbon on top of it all, allowing others a full view of her face. A soft black evening dress with a big heavy skirt. Her upper body is dressed in a lace embellished ribbon and a short tailored jacket. Her wearing hands are donned with long lace gloves, not exposing any bit of skin exterior. Yuzuki had been to her quarters a few times, and had seen the depravity that Pro and Sino had done in there. While players could not touch the NPCs in any ill way it was clear what Sheltier was used for. Following her was the overseer of the fourth floor guardian Shiel. Shiel was a slender yet curvaceous woman with long purple hair and purple eyes. She usually wore a revealing sleeveless lilac Jiangsum with detached lilac arm sleeves and white boots. She wore glasses and had a scar on her right cheek. Shiel was a reborn homunculus. She was stronger than the homunculi that acted as maids and butlers of Nazark. Those were made of clay, while Shiel was made from the remains of a woman who died fighting for a friend. She was granted the title of overseer of the fourth floor, but not guardian. This was due to two factors. The first was that the guardian of the fourth floor was a raid level boss. Even though he was only leveled at 70, it would take a small army to beat him. Second was the fact that Shiel was probably one of the deadliest fighters in all of Nazark. Next came the fifth floor guardian Cossidus, having an enormous body size of 2. 5 meters, Cossidus has the appearance of an insect walking on two feet to fusion between a mantis and an ant. But the tail twice as long as his height, Cossidus is covered in sharp spikes like icicles, and has a strong jaw that can easily snap peoples of his hands, hold a silver halberd, while the remaining two hands hold a mace emitting black light, and a crooked shaped sheath, which seems to be for a broadsword. But the breathtaking cold air, the pale blue, hardened bone armor oozes out diamond dust like bright light. His shoulders and back look like uplifted icebergs. Finally came the guardian of the seventh floor demiurge a demon with dark skin and nicely combed black hair. Behind the round glasses are eyes so squinted that they are not normally visible. Wearing an orange suit with a tie, dressed like a gentleman, his manner of speaking and way of walking, made it clear that he was a force to be reckoned with. Behind his back is a silver tail, covered with metal plates and six long spikes at the end. Demiurge was probably the most evil NPC to be created in Nazareth by human standards. Word and present yourselves to the rulers of Nazark. Ordered Momoga. Sheltier dropped to a knee. Sheltier blood phone. Guardian of the first, second and third floors, bow before the, the supreme beings, the most beautiful of all beings in the world, said Sheltier. Shield dropped to a knee. Shield of the broken mind, overseer of the fourth floor guardian, bow before the supreme beings and my creator. Beings that gave me the life for which I am forever thankful. Koikuts bowed. I Koikuts. Guardian of the fifth floor. Bow before the supreme beings, said the large blue bug. Both Mare and Aura fell to a knee. I or Darby Fiona speak for the Fiona twins, guardians of the sixth floor. We bow before the most mighty of the supreme beings, said Or. Demiuch bowed. I demige bow before the most wise and powerful of the supreme beings. Albedo followed suit. I Albedo, commander and overseer of the floor guardians bow before the supreme beings and the two people I love with all my heart. We the floor guardians declare our allegiance to warlord Yuzuki and overlord Momoga, the most powerful of all the supreme beings said the guardians together. Momoga looked at the floor guardians, before letting out a small chuckle, that turned into a full belly laugh as she threw her arms wide open. Splendid. I expect nothing less from those who command the denizens of the great tomb of Nazark. Yuzukich Khan would you please give them a rundown of our situation, said Momoga as she summoned a smaller replica of her throne, and took a seat. Yuzukich stepped forward. As you are all no doubt aware at 0000 hours there was a disturbance in force field that protects Nazark from all threats. Upon felling the shifting of our barrier we ordered Sabas and the demon shinobi to set out and gather information for us. Sabas has his report for us, said Yuzukic. Sabas stepped out from where he stood. Sabas the head butler of Nazarek was an elder gentleman who looked like he was the servant of a noble family. However his looks made him seem weaker than he really was. Sabas was easily as strong as any of the guardians. Floor guardians as Yuzukic sama has stated the shifting of our barrier was a minor disturbance, but the cause has been fined. A teleportation spell was used on the great tomb of Nazark. Teleportation. But how? No one not even the supreme ones have that kind of power. Said Mare. The blast of aura was felt throughout the room as Alberto rounded on Mare. 
You dare question the strength of our masters, I should cut you down where you stand. Yelled Albedo as she summoned her black war axe. Or got between Mare and Albedo and summoned her whip. You will not hurt my brother you bitch. Growled out the little dark elf. Albedo glared at Or. You best watch yourself child. Yelled Albedo. Enough. Yelled Momoga flexing her own Or, putting Albedo's to shame. Mare speaks the truth Albedo. Even as powerful as we are it takes more than Yuzukichikan and I to move Nazarek at our current strength. Albedo's eyes widened before falling to her knees and putting her head on the ground. Forgive me Lady Momoga. I only meant to enforce your will. Momoga looked at Naruto who nodded. Albedo see me after this. We will discuss your overzealous nature then. Shil you shall join us, said Yuzukich. Of course Lord Yuzukich, said both Shil and Albedo. Sabas continued with his report. Detailing how Nazarek was no longer in the Great Swamp, but in an open field. Following that plans were made in how to defend Nazarek. I was decided that Mare would take several earth and nature elementals, and turn the open plains into a zone of hills, that would made it harder to find Nazarek. Once plans were finished Momoga left with Naruto taking off to his personal office, with Albedo and Shiel following after him. While normally Albedo would have chastised the oftentimes dim-witted girl she was Yuzukage's personal creation. A creation that she would not speak back to, especially with the silent rage that was emitting from him. When in the confines of his officer Yuzukage snapped his fingers as two thin wires flow from the rafters, and grabbed Albedo's hands, raising them above her hands. She looked up and saw two demon shinobi standing there pulling the wires tight enough to draw blood, letting Albedo know that if they so wished they could have taken her hands off. She'll quickly drew a short sword and cut away Albedo's clothes, leaving her naked for all to see. While the succubus felt no shame in being seen, she didn't want to be seen like this by one of those she loved. Albedo do you know what your job is? Asked Yuzukich. Hi. In the event that the serpent beings are absent, I am to oversee all denizens of Nazarek and protect them. And yet in a moment of anger at Mare making an observation you drew your weapon on him, stated Shiel. Albedo's eyes whitened. My lord I only did what I thought was right. Yelled Albedo. And I believe you. However outside of sparing and a direct insider threat to Nazarek, we do not raise our weapons against our own. It goes against the very idea of Nazarek, said Yuzukich thinking of how Momoga hated Lucy for her. Albedo looked away from the man she loved. She had disappointed him. No not just him she had disappointed her lady as well. Forgive me Lord Yuzukich, said the succubus. I forgive you, but you will not escape your punishment, said Yuzukich as he held out his hand and summoned a staff with a lightning crystal on the back of it. Albedo's eyes whitened. A white lightning rod. Please Yuzukich sama anything but that. Pleaded the beauty. The words fell on deaf ears Yuzukich walked up to Albedo and touched the rod too in between her breasts. Had the walls not been soundproof her screams would have been heard throughout all of Nazarek. Every nerve was screaming in a ganji for what felt like hours, but was only a few seconds. Yuzukich removed the rod from her as Albedo slumped forward, sweat dripping from her body. One down, nine to go, said Yuzukich. Over and over the rod touched her skin, and each subsequent time was worse than the last. Each time brought great agony to Alberto. On the third time she urinated. The urine was ignored as Naruto gave her a minute to breath. This was painful to his heart as well, but it needed to be done. On the fifth time she vomited, by the time the rod touched her, an eighth time she was on the verge of passing out. Once it was finally over Alito was released from the wires, and slumped forward where a pair of demon kanoichi caught her. Her body on the verge of collapse. A burn mark was on her chest and sweat dripped from her body. Lo rode Yuzu, cage, said Albedo as she tried to keep from slipping into unconsciousness. Yuzukic walked up to Albedo and gently touched her face. This was just a warning Albedo. All of Nazarek are family and if you hurt this family then you will know pain. You are on probation for the next month, and Sabas will take over your duties as overseer. You will work as his assistant. Should he find your progress wanting, then you will be punished again. Albedo barely had the strength to speak let alone talk. She knew that she had gotten off easy. I would let it happen again Yuzukich sama my love, said Albedo as she blacked out. Have a pair of maids wash and dress Albedo. Put her to bed. Albedo I took no pleasure in punishing you. Had you actually harmed Mare the punishment would have been ten times worse, said Yuzukich, as the demon Kanoichi took Albedo away. Shiel took a step around the vomit and urine, as a pair of maids came in and began to clean at his floor. You regret what you did? Asked Shiel. Yuzukich looked at Shiel. Do you take offense to my actions Shiel? Asked Yuzukich. Whether I take offense or not I am but your servant. I am your weapon to deal out punishment however you see fit my lord, said Shiel. Naruto nodded. Go and get some rest. We have much to do in the coming days, said Yuzukich. 0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
I have never read the light novel or read the manga, but a lot of things that the NPCs did that should have gotten them in trouble. He let off with a warning. Sheltier was the only one he ever punished, but that was stupid, since she fell victim to a world item that she had no defense against. Lip is almost allowed inferior to die, and all Lanes did was yell at her. Solution should have been lightly punished for making a false report on Sabas. I know Ains turned it to his advantage, but at the same time he removed a highly skilled piece from the board, when he should have just altered his plans, and made to earn a new Varen part of said plans. Naruto and Momoga will not be that lenient on their subjects when they fail or displease them greatly, but they will reward them for going above and beyond. The term firm, but fair applies here. Anyway see you next time. Momoga sat on top of a cliff with the plight of sister Nabil Gemma and Lupus Rigna Beta behind her. Of course Lupus was there to work under Yuzukich for the day while Nate worked for her, but that was splitting hairs at the moment. Barely a week had passed, and it was still determined that Nazarick was to remain at level 4 alert. All of the demon shinobi had been dispatched far and wide to gather whatever information they could. Under the subjection of Damage two off-site bases manners were under construction, and would both be given under the command of subfloor bosses. Were it not for Yuzukich backing Damage's play, she would have shut that idea down in a minute. It was risky to say the least to say the least, but Yuzukich was the frontline commander for a reason. Over the last week everyone did their part. Even Sana and Naruto. Both would take time to themselves every day, not as the rulers of Nazarick, but just as good friends to just talk and relax. Several times when alone the duo would divert into theory of why they came to this world. The working theory was that it's some type of dimensional magic that had brought them here. Both had already decided that they would rather stay in this world, rather than return to their old world, as actually role-playing as the villains would be fun. Both had also delved into trying to figure out their powers. Sana had quickly discovered that her skills as an Ikormiser translated quite well, as did her racial skills of a rat. It helped a lot that Daymax was giving her flying lessons. Of course her training was going much more smoothly than it would seem. Part of it was due to her already instinctively knowing some of her attacks. But then again she wasn't normally on the front lines like Naruto was and was a bit rusty. Speaking of Naruto, no Yuzukich he was currently enjoying himself down below in the frozen hell that was the fifth floor. Yuzukich was currently sparing with Kasadas using a tier 3 katana, while Kasadas was using his own tier 6 battle saber, as his halberd which other was the equivalent of a divine class item. An explosion happened in the middle of the field that they were fighting on, followed by Kasadas flying out and into an ice hole. Naruto held out his hand and created a flaming orb that was surrounded by three blades. Flaming Rasen Shuriken. Yelled Naruto throwing the attack. Koitus rose out of the wall and raised his saber slashing the attack in half, forcing it to explode on either side of him, but his saber suffered serious damage, as it melted. Kasada slitted his blade. Not in anger, but in awe of the power of one of his masters. Amazing. To think. That your power. Could damage. A saber of. This class. When you are limiting. Your own power. My lord, said Kasada bowing to his master out of a sense of honor. Yuzukic smiled. And sheathed his sword. Thank nothing of it Kasada. I enjoyed our spar, said Yuzukich returning the bow. What do you two think of Yuzukich and Kasadas' battle? Asked Momoga as she sipped from the tea that had been provided to her. Master Kasadas was holding his own quite well against yuzukich sama said Nabil. Lopez licked her lips. yuzukich sama was quite the force. He can breed me any time if he can give me pups with even half of his power. Sana Momoga chalked on her tea at that proclamation. Lopez knee said that is an upright thing to say in front of Momoga sama Chastised at the blushing doppelganger. Lopez grinned at her younger sister. But I'm not lying am I? After all I've heard you in your room. Oh, Yuzukich-sama. You're so big. You're tearing my little body apart. Momoga hummed at this, while Sana blushed. Well she knew that the current Naruto before wasn't what he really looked like or rather that was what he looked like now. His avatar wasn't a dissimilar to how he looked like originally. And Momoga Sana could easily admit that Yuzukich Naruto was a rather fetching man. Too bad he'll never give a plain Jane like me the time of day, thought Sana. Location. Great Tomb of Nazarick. Place. The 10th floor. Time. Late evening, Yuzukich and Momoga sat in a room with Sabas, Demiuge and Albedo standing before them. The room was actually rather important to Nazarick's defenses as a whole as it was the cartography room. An ever-evolving map that Blueplant had helped create to help in the defense of Nazarick. It helped that the table that held the cartographer was actually a world-class item known as the Endless Map. Paired with the world-class item orb of viewing, nothing could get past them. Nothing was out of their sight. Then again with Yuzukich's primary weapon was pretty damn strong in its own right. You three had something you wish to report to us. Asked Momoga. Hi Momoga-sama, said the trio. Sabas stepped forward, fulfilling his active role of overseer. As we have keep up the alert for the past week we have kept our patrols roaming for the five days, even after Mare has created the false hills that cover Nazarick. I believe that it is safe to reduce the threat level at the moment. What do you think Yuzukich? Asked Momoga looking to her friend. Nothing has been found within the walls of our home. I don't see why we can't reduce the threat level, said Yuzukich. Momoga nodded. Very well. 
The threat level is reduced to level 1 unless absolutely necessary. Demiag, I need a full report on the things that the demon shinobi and our patrols have found by the end of the day. At that point I want all Gordings except for victim and Gargantia. To come to a meeting with me, said Mamuga. Hi I will ensure that it is done laddie, said Demiurge. Albedo, get ready to depart, said Yuzukich. Lord, asked Albedo. I've been cooked up in here too long while visiting the lake and six floors nice, I need to starch my legs. There was a village about 10 kilometers away. I want you and Shield to accompany me as my personal guard, said Yuzukich. Mamuga turned to Yuzukich and raised a brow. Is that wise? Asked Mamuga. The information that the demon shinobi can provide is limited to the things that they hear and see. They can't do everything. Sometimes that requires a hands-on approach, said Yuzukich with a smirk on his face. How long were you expecting to be gone my lord Yuzukich? Asked Sabas. A day or so. Ten kilometers isn't much, but I'm always expecting the unexpected, said Yuzukich. Momoga nodded. Please be careful Yuzukich, said Momoga. I can't afford to lose you, Sana said silently to herself. Location. Great Forest of Top. Place. Path leading to Karn Village. Time. Noon. The Great Forest of Top was a dense woodland that saw several creatures living in it. The humans of the little village that sat at the open plains to the most northern section of the forest had little to fear from the likes of the deer elves and other assortment of creatures, so long as the wise king was there. However the threat of man still existed as the people of Karn Village learned. Two girls dashed through the woods at an alarming rate as a pair of soldiers chased after them, swords drawn and ready to kill. A blonde-haired beautiful girl in her late teens to early twenties, and a red-haired girl who was barely approaching her tenth summer of life. The red-haired girl tripped and fell to the ground. Nemu yelled the older girl as she covered her sister as a sword slash opened her back up, relishing a spray of blood. Enri yelled Nemu. Enri gave her sister a pained girl. I'm fine, you need to run, said Enri. Nemu shook her head in the negative. We already lost mama and papa. I'm not going to lose you too, yelled Nemu. Then you can die together you little horse, yelled one of the men raising his sword to strike. Willow wisp, said a voice. The man went up in purple flames. He yelled in pain as he began to roll on the ground to put out the flames. His partner looked at him in complete and utter fear. It's no use. Well Willow wisp is only a tear force spell, it is quite difficult to put out without a counter spell or charm, said a man. Henry and the surviving soldier turned and looked at the source of the voice. Henry blushed upon seeing the man's majestic features. The other man blushed looking at the two beauties that were with the man. If he could kill the man if he could capture them and take them back to sell to some of the nobles though. Before he could finish his thoughts the purple-haired beauty removed from her back again pair of shears, vanished, and reappeared cutting his head off. Trash like you shouldn't think such thoughts about Yuzukuchi-sama and Albedo-sama, said the woman her glasses concealing the deadly glint in her eyes. What should we do about the Yuzukuchi-sama? Asked Albedo heating her battle axe over her shoulder. Yuzukuchi turned to the two girls who both looked at the man. In awe. He reached his hand out and summoned a vial of blood. This freaked both girls out a little. Yuzukich kneeled before them. Drink this and it shall heal your back, said Yuzukich. And he hesitantly took the vial and drank it. Well it didn't taste bad, it didn't taste good either. Within seconds the pain was gone and her skin, muscle, and tendons knighted themselves back together. Yuzukich raised a brow at the way healing working. Since they had played in a game all it did before was replenish their health bar, here it cured the entire ailment. Sana would like to know this. Are there any more men like that? Asked Yuzukich. Yes. In our village just up the road, said the blonde. Yuzukich raised his hand and created a barrier over the girls. Nothing as sophisticated as Momoga could create, but it would do. He thought about it for a second before pulling out three whistles. Stay inside of the barrier and you shall be safe. Two of the whistles will summon a horde of goblins, the third will summon a golem to you. We will return shortly, said Yuzukich. The trio turned and sprinted down the path to head to the village. Location. Karn village. Place. Village elder's house. Time. Noon, the fourth son of the noble family of Olba wanted to yawn in boredom. Here he was overseeing the looting of a village for the king and country on the orders of his superiors, with nothing to show for it. Sure a few dead here, a trinket or two there and the only good-looking girl had escaped. Normally his troops didn't touch the females of villages for fear of reprisal from his superiors, but they had been given a clean slate this time around. Already a few of his men were partaking of the spoils. Then again their whole goal was the assassination of the head warrior. A man who was said to have 1000 kills under his belt. If there was a good chance they were going to die, then he and his men would partake of all they could. Sir, yelled a sullider running over to him. What is it? Asked the noble's son. In the village square. A trio of travelers. Two of them quite beautiful, said the soldier. The son looked at him with a raised brow. Beautiful was quite tough to pull off. Even several of the noble ladies of the court were not all that agreeable with their looks. He jumped up and followed after the man to the village square. Once there he saw the people that they had rounded up, the dead, and a trio of travelers surrounded by his men. The women were both beautiful with one of them having horns. A demon kin of the old wars perhaps. Rare and quite valuable. The purple-haired woman. Also beautiful. 
more so than even his last conquest was. Something worthwhile to play with before giving to his men. The last one amen. Handsome features definitely of noble birth, but those fox tails. Bee skin. Something that would see many young women in love with his features. Men capture them alive if you can, don't hurt them too badly, said the fourth son. Disgusting, said the purple haired woman. I agree with you Shiel san Yuzuki sama what is you will? Asked the horned woman. Kill them all, but please keep the damage to the village at a minimum, said Yuzuki. The son opened his mouth to speak, but didn't get far as in less than a minute his entire platoon of 70 men was all but wiped out, leaving him as the lone survivor. It all happened so fast that his eyes couldn't even keep up. All he saw was blood, guts, and limbs flying. The fourth son staggered backwards and hit the ground. Monsters. Halspin. Defliers of the earth. Yelled the man. Silence. Yelled Yuzuki. The in fell silent to Yuzuki's commanding voice. Listen to the words about to come out of my mouth. You are to ride to met your commander, bring him here alongside every soldier that falls under his command, and know that Yuzukich frontline commander and second in command of Nazirk is waiting for him, said Yuzukich. The fourth son was so scared at this point that he ended up defecating on himself, before he managed to get up and run away, before getting on a horse and fleeing. Shadow follow, said Yuzukich as part of his shadow detached and followed after the son. Yuzukich turned and looked at the rest of the people in the village, many of whom looked at him in mixture of awe and fear. Naruto let out a silent sigh. Story of my freaking life. Yuzuki J.K.A. Yuzumaki Naruto found it strange that he was once again transported to another world for the second time in his life. That's right. Being transported inside of a game was not the first time he had been, what was the word that they used? Isikid. Yeah, Isikid away to a new world. To understand we have to go back about 137 years. Yuzumaki Naruto was born on October 10th year 210 after Sasuke. To the fourth leader of the village Namakiz Minato, and the last known member of the village of Edding Tides Yuzumaki Kashina. The village had been attacked by the Kyobi no Kitsune and a masked man calling himself a Chihamadar. But it was all a plot within a plot within a plot. But we'd be here all day if Naruto jumped into that rabbit hole. Because of Karama that was the Kyobi's name Naruto was treated like a peer of the village. Ignored with the occasional death threat and harassment, but he made it though it. By the time he was 16, the elemental nations were involved in the fourth great shinobi war. Which the allied shinobi forces of the five great villages won. Following this was an era of tense peace, since the very nature of shinobi was conflict. When Naruto turned 25 he was appointed as the Hokage, the leader of his entire village. And strangely enough the council had asked Naruto to procreate with several females to revive the Uzumaki clan. Of course he refused stating that he was happy to be married to Hayuga Hinata, with the occasional playtime with his sister-in-law, who didn't plan on having kids, that didn't stop him from having kids with others though. He had a son who was named Arashi with Kazuhana Koyuki the Daimo of Spring Country, and a pair of twin daughters with the priestess of Demon Country Shion, with each girl getting named after their mothers. By the time Naruto was 70 his second apprentice Sarada had ascended to the throne, and had become the ninth Hokage of Kanoha, after his first apprentice and grandson of the third Hokage. After years of battles, watching his children and grandchildren and even great-grandchildren grow, and playing politics, Naruto grew tired and just enjoyed the last years of his life in peace. Naruto ended up allowing his body to die following after Hinata nearly two years on his wife, died on his 99th birthday. Instead of following his wife to the Pure Lands, he was instead pulled by an unknown power to a world that had been destroyed by humanity's foolishness. Over the years there he remembered everything about his life, turned it into a book series, he had gotten a degree in ecology, and started trying to fix the world. He had managed to create several geofronts, water labs that would clean water, and several air purifiers. Thanks to his effects the people didn't have to go out in full suits, but still had to use full breathers still. And all this before he was 30 years old in this new world. Following the expansion of his company he discovered the game Idrisil. He researched and joined up with the game going with the Kitsune race with the Assassin class. He had played as a solo player for a long time, before he ran into touch me and Momoga who created a clan 9 Zulgaon. The rest as they say is history. A Musikage don't know are you alright, said the village elder. Musikage was snapped out of his memories. After the fight with those soldiers he had decided that he wasn't killing anyone for free, and asked for information on the surrounding area and kingdoms. Of course this was well after the village was allowed to mourn and bury their dead. When he had discovered the continent was divided into several human kingdoms, with the strongest being the empire. So full of themselves that was all they called themselves. From all the information that he was able to gather there were about five human kingdoms and a dwarf kingdom, the slain theocracy more called then kingdom and the dragon kingdom. I'm fine. Just lost in thought. So older Sama where does Karn village fall in all of this? Pointing to the map he saw that they were at the edge of the Riestai's kingdom. Yuzuki studied this for a moment. Easily the one kingdom that was to close for comfort. But looking at the map there were several cities in between the capital and Karn village. Irantal was the most direct path from Karn and Azur to the capital. The duo would spend the next several hours going over information. 
By the time they had finished speaking Shiel came into the room and bowed to Yuzukic. Yuzukic saw me several men on horseback have entered my detention range, said Shiel. No way that fool lost my shadow. As there's still a half a day's ride out from here, said Yuzukic. They will be here within the hour, said Shiel. Yuzukic nodded. Understood, said Yuzukic as he touched his ear. Momoga can you hear me? Asked Yuzukic. Hi I can. Did something happen? Asked Momoga, worry slipping into her voice. I'm fine. I'm going to transfer some information to you. Data transfer, said Yuzukic. Yeah. He yelled Sana over the link. Are you alright? Asked Naruto. I'm fine. It was just a little strange to feel that information dump in my head. We'll have to reserve data transfer for emergencies. But everything that you sent me is quite fascinating. This empire, they have access to deadly weapons. We're going to have to send a spy to there. One step at a time, Momoga. Let me deal with this problem here, said Yuzukich. Very well. Once you finish up there come home Naruto, I miss you, said Sana. Before Naruto could respond the connection was cut. It was hard to keep up with who was speaking at times. Momoga the leader of Ainzu will gauner Sana the salary woman who had been Naruto's friend for well over a decade. They had met in person a few times. During the Ainzu will gauner will party, at the bar with their goods friends touch me, Bikubiku Chigama and Paroran Sino, and even the times they went to the bars alone. Even the one time they, Lord Yuzukich, said Albedo. Yuzukich turned to Albedo. What is it Albedo? They're here, said Albedo. Yuzukich rose to his feet and summoned his ninjato and kadachi, and put them on the left side of his hip in his belt. Naruto turned to the elder. Elder Sama I will need you to accompany me to the main gate, so we may smooth over any misunderstandings, said Yuzukich. Of course Yuzukich don't know, said the elder walking behind the kitsune. Location. Karn village. Place. Gates of the northern road. Time. Late afternoon. As Astronov was born a poor man on a frontier village of Riestai's kingdom. During his teenage years he would become a mercenary and train under a former Adomtai ranked adventurer, before becoming a member of the kingdom's army. It took only a few years to work his way up the ranks, and become the head warrior, leader of all of the kingdom's forces, with his own warrior attack force, that answered directly to the king. Of course he had political enemies in the nobles and other factions of the kingdom courts. In the ten years he had served the kingdom he had fought in countless battles and killed countless more men who opposed the king. So it was a surprise head warrior who was met at the front gate by who he assumed was a village elder, a woman decked out in full armor with large black wings, another woman wearing glasses with a large pair of shears and, a spear creature, if Gazif was sure of what he was looking at. He gave the order to his people, and they spread out forming a defensive perimeter. Gazif dismounted from his horse and approached with his guard up, but not putting his hand near his blade. The creature walked up as well, but unlike Gazif his guard was lowered. Arrogance perhaps. The creature stopped just outside of blade distance. Judging by his two blades he was a trained swordsman, but the noble families of the countries to the far east were known to wear blades upon their belts to show their status. Was this creature half-human or simply blessed? May I have the pleasure of knowing who I am speaking with? Asked Gazif. The creature smiled. Where I'm from it's common courtesy to give your name first, but we're not in my country. My name is Yuzukich. If you require an epithet I am lord of the nine great beasts. Beside me are my two companions. Shiel of the Rending Shears and Albio the Succubus Queen. If Gazif wasn't on his guard before he was now. Succubi well not the strongest of creatures they could still be quite formidable when cornered. As far as he knew there were four ranks of succubus in Mature, Mature, Arch, and Queen. The last time the Queen had been seen it had taken an adventurer of Orich Halcom rank to kill her. And that was forty years ago. I'm Gazif Stronov. Head warrior of the Kingdom of Riestais, said Gazif. The pleasure Gazif Dono not that long ago we were in pitched combat with soldiers, so forgive us for our current state of wariness, said Yuzukic. Gazif smiled. Funny I was thinking that you were invaders, said Gazif. I'm not, but the invaders you were thinking of have already closed ranks around the village. Or at least the routes have escaped to the south, said Yuzukic. But that's what would be tour had Momoga not already positioned several skeleton warriors to strike and kill them, once they knew for sure who the target was. The two warriors would spend the next several hours getting the villagers to safety and speaking about small things or at least small to Gazif. Yuzukich was feeding all of the information to Demiag and Momoga. By the time twilight was rolling around the village had been surrounded, and Gazif and his men had come up with a plan to confront what had been identified as the slain bureaucracy. They had even discovered that the head warrior was the real target, and the village was just a bait to lure him him. Just before Gazif and his squadron set off Yuzukich gave him a gift. It took 30 minutes for the item to active. A testament to the head warrior's strength. Once Yuzukich, Shiel, and Albedo arrived at the battlefield they took a good look around. Yuzukich snorted. It was a bunch of magic casters and angels of the flame. How he hated enemy magic casters with a passion. It had nothing to do with the spells themselves. No, it had more to do with the fact that if it wasn't for his being part spirit, then magic would be his greatest being. Who in the devil are you? Asked the leader with a scar. My name is Yuzukich, and since the head warrior got bored playing with you I'll be taking his place, but first I need some information from you, said Yuzukich. 
attack, yelled the scared purse. Two angels flow at Yuzukich at a speed that would have been impressive to anyone else, but not to the frontline commander of Ainzul Gown. Quickly drawing both his blades he destroyed the angels. Before the other angels could do anything Sheil and Albedo made quick work of them. Several of the magic casters launched attackers at Yuzukich and the others, but they dealt so little damage, one foolish man raised his hand and threw a stone at Yuzukich. Only to lose his head in an explosion of blood and bone. What the hell? Asked the scared priest. Albedo what was unnecessary. The level of force you used could have blown up a mountain, said Yuzukich. Albedo turned to Yuzukich. Forgive me my lord, but there is a prerequisite for fighting one such as yourself and Momogasama. I must agree with Lady Albedo my lord. These vermin barely qualify, said Shil. Yuzuki chuckled. Please both of you. It would take 1000 lifetimes for them to qualify in your eyes, said Yuzuki. Enough. Yelled the scared priest. Principality of observation. Crush this whelp with your divine powers. The largest angel raised its mace to attack Yuzuki, but Shil appeared in front of her creator and blocked the attack. How dare you try and kill my creator and with such a weak attack. Yelled Shiel, pushed the mace back, she jumped into the air and cut the principality of observation in half. The scare priest clutched his hand in annoyance. That is fourth tear magic spell of summoning. But it seems you are worthy of my most powerful magic as given to me by the archbishop yelled the scare priest. Yuzuki raised a brow at this. The crystal seemed familiar. Albedo, she'll be on guard, said Yuzuki. Hi Yuzuki sama said the two women as they took up defensive positions in front of their leader. Behold. Dominion authority. Yelled the scared priest. It, it can't be. Said Yuzukich seemingly in fear. The scared press smirked at Yuzukich. That's right, behold the might of the strongest angel. The power equivalent to a seventh tier magic spell the angel that defeated a demon god single-handedly 200 years ago. It took 150 mages of the sunlight scripture to create a creature that our gods could do with ease. Shut up, said Yuzukich. The joy and elation that the scared priest felt evaporated like water in a desert. The demon before him should have felt fear, he should have felt terror. He should be begging for his life. Insidi told him. Himnigan grid Luin, captain of the Sunlight Scripture to shut up. Albedo and Shiel both let out laughs. I can't believe I asked you both to be on guard for such a weak enemy. Laughed Yuzukic. Enough. Feel the power of the slain theocracy. Divine judgment. Yelled the scared priest. The massive spear inside of the angel's hands broke apart, before forming a spear of light that slammed into Yuzukic. Yuzukic stood there taking the attack. Nigan smirked thinking that he couldn't move, but then the laughing started. Not a laugh of pain, but a laugh of amusement. A laugh that told him how embarrassed he was of their pitiful attempts at harming him. There was not a screeth on him. It was useless. When the light died down Yuzukich stood there shaking slightly. So this is pain. How many years has it been since something hurt me? This numbness, this shaking. How dare you? Yield Albedo as Sheil was Shaknik beside her in rage. How dare you harm a single hair on Lord Yuzukich's head? I'll kill you all. Albedo, she'll both of you calm down, said Yuzukich. Albedo turned to Yuzukich. But Lord Yuzukich. They hurt you, the person I love most of all. Albedo Sama. Please you're embarrassing yourself, said Shiel. Yuzukich took a step forward catching everyone's attention. Sorry to say, but I'm quite bored and need to return to my home. I'll end this in a single blow. Void Rasengan, said Yuzukich as a black spinning orb appeared in his hand. Yuzukich vanished and appeared above the angel, before slamming it in the angel's body, and absorbed it into nothingness. Yuzukich landed on the ground. And turned to the girls. They got their orders beforehand. The air that was once filled with holy energy seemed to vanish as the skin returned to the darkness of the night. A minute later the air creaked. What was that? Asked Nigan. It seems that someone was monitoring us. Or at least tried to. If I had to guess it was your superiors, said Yuzukich. They were watching, said Nigan. Ha 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 ha. They expected you to defeat the head warrior. The man known as the strongest warrior in all of the kingdoms, said Naruto. And who in the hell do you think you are? yelled Nigan. Albedo slammed her axe into the ground. Quitworm. You are addressing the strongest warrior in all of Nazark. Commander of the frontline teams when we go to war and the only man strong enough to claim my body for his own. Lord Yuzukich. Yell Albedo. Yuzukich sama there is no needed to keep this filth alive anymore, said Shiel. Yuzukich put a hand on his chin. Only leave a handful alive to spread the name of Ain Zul Gown, said. Yuzukich the scratching of quill on paper was the only sound in the large office. Momogu leaned forward in her seat and looked at the paperwork. It had been a day since Yuzukich had sent his report back to her with Albedo. She had read it and reread it several times at this point that she had memorized it. Of course Yuzukich wouldn't be back for another day or so. Something to do with the empire that was so arrogant that they didn't have a proper name. Raising from her seat she turned to the homunculus maid that was attending her. Foss. The young woman looked shocked that Momoga knew her by name. Yes, Melody. Leave me. I wish to be alone for a while, said Momoga as she placed a hand on her desk. The maid bowed. Yes Melody, said the maid as she walked to the door and walked out. Once alone the vestige of Momoga dropped and Omi Sana remained. 
the one salary woman turned queen of her own evil empire, turned to the mirror that was in her office and looked at herself. Sana raised her hand and created a Topalganger, only the Topalganger wasn't her current self. It was her former self. A taller than average woman with shoulder length dark brown hair, pulled into a ponytail, her only unique feature being her intense black eyes. This was the salary woman who spent all her money on rent, food, and games. The woman who turned down several offers for dates, mixers, and the like. The woman who was only good enough for one night stands and the very rare threesome. Sana had never been a Yamato Natashiko beauty like her mother was, having inherited more of her father's plain features. While not a stunning beauty she had been better than plain. She had never been smart enough to make it into the top 50 of her class, but was clever enough to get several grants to attend college. It had been during a low point in college that she wanted to surrender it all. Her grades were slipping, her friends all but abandoned her. She was all alone, and it was looking like a swift end by jumping off a building was preferable. But then it happened. She had found Idrisil and instantly fell in love. Of course with how the game worked she quickly discovered how bad things could get. The danger of attacks, humanoid players outright racism, king on a daily basis. It was like the old Minecraft server 2B2T almost anything went. Upon creation of her account she found herself in hot water with a demon hunting party. While they couldn't touch her, they didn't make things easy by telling her the things they would do to her avatar's body if they could. Before they could pre-mod trap her at their base, she was saved by the non-human players Takami and Yuzukich. Both players who had participated in the Idrisil 1v1 tournament. Touch me had bested Yuzukich in the finals. Yuzukich had been fine with that, and following that they formed a party that would become most feared. Upon rescuing her they asked her to join up with them. Sana Mamo instantly agreed, I only to be close to the two men who had saved her life. Following this the trio became close, and the founders of the then clan Nainul Gaon, and the subsequent guild Ainzul Gaon. Of course over the subsequent years she had come to form connections with the rest of the guild. The Kubikuchikuma was like her little sister, Piranachino was her best friend alongside Tachmi, then there was Yuzukich, the person she had fallen head over heels for. Not the avatar, not the frontline commander, but the man behind all of that. She didn't know when she fell for Yuzukich. No Yuzumaki Naruto. A man she had only ever met eight times Earl. The man that she worked for. Indirectly of course as she was middle management and didn't speak directly with the big wigs of Yuzumaki Industries. The last time Naruto and Sana had met it, it had been just after, after, no. She pushed that memory down and locked the cellar door with chains. She had called him to her apartment. She was drunk, she was tired, and she had been crying about her lack of love live. When Naruto arrived he got drunk with her. He lamented about the fact that despite his wealth and influence, he didn't care for it. He was surrounded by yes men all day, women that wanted to get into his wallet though his pants, and fighting with other businesses and politicians that didn't give one damn about fixing the world, only holding on to their fleeting power. He spoke about his dead wife and children. Something she knew about, but it never tried to bring up for fear of what it would lead to. The duo braided over the alcohol, sharing their loneliness with each other. What did two drunken lonely people do? They had. They didn't make love. They didn't confess undying love for each other. They had. Raw unrelenting passion. The feeling of his muscle back under her fingernails as he buried himself in her over and over again, while she bled his back with her nails. The amount of times he released inside of her would have seen her pregnant were it not for her birth control regiment. How she loved every second of his raw passion, the powerful arms that gripped her tightly. It was almost perfect. The only thing that had hurt her was that he whispered his dead wife's name instead of her the last time he had come inside of her. She hadn't been angry not really, but it still stung somewhat to hear his wife's beautiful name uttered for her plain looking self. Even to this day despite knowing that it was two lonely souls that just needed to be lost in each other for only a moment. When it was all over and she woke up late the next morning and was worried she was going to get fired. Naruto had just called her manager, her boss, and her boss's boss, and told them that she was in a meeting with him, and would be for the rest of the day. Sana had actually been somewhat enraged that he would use his position of power to get her out of trouble, but then again she couldn't say anything, since they spent the rest of the day in like the extinct rabbits of earth. Everywhere. Her living room, her shower, her kitchen, her bedroom. Everywhere. God's the amount of fluids left in the house. After that the next day well later Naruto had left and Sana was back at work they didn't think about it, they didn't talk about it. It was as if it never happened. Or at least that's what Sana wanted to believe. Every time they spoke afterwards there is a lingering feeling, a touch here, a subtle word there. Shaking her head of the past she looked at herself in the mirror and frowned. She removed her clothes and armor. The armor, robes and even most of her rings she wore was divine class and easily her favorite things. Most of her equipment had gummed to her powers by probably 23 to 30%. She searched through her inventory in her head and quickly ground what she was looking for. 
a revealing set of robes that had slits up her right leg stopping at her hip, thigh-high boots with a golden trim, a large pointed hat with hat, two leather belts that crisscrossed on her white hips, and a wooden staff made from elder wood with a red orb in the center. To finish off her look, she changed her hair from the silver white it was to a shimmering black, and finally her skin was a shade or two darker than it was Earl. Oh wait. She was in the new world. A shade or two darker than her old skin tone was. And she put a small glamour over her eyes that turned them blue. She raised her hand and vanished from her room, intent on getting some fresh air. Location. Great Tomb of Nazark. Place. First floor. Time. Well after midnight. Demirge was probably the most evil SOB in Eric. Even the lore in his head or his life story made it that way. As an imp spawn he had been weak, even compared to his siblings. He was beaten day in and day out, but he wasn't powerful. Not like the greater imp his mother was, a slave to lesser demon in this small territory, barely 100 kms that it controlled. He was one of that thing's spawn. While he wasn't strong he was smart. Dangerously so. He quickly learned that On wasn't born into power one earned power. To gain power he devoted book after book, spell after spell, enemy after enemy. And before he knew it he was had killed the master of the territory and became the new lord of it, but that wasn't enough. He needed more. Before he realized it he was on the level of a greater demon. But it didn't last. One day he met Imalbert and swore to follow him and the other 41 supreme beings to the gates of hell themselves if they desired. Of course that was all programming in his mind, but Demiurge and the others of Nazar didn't really think too much on it. It was just there. To them regardless of the pasts that they had, the supreme ones would always be their gods. Today Demiurge was with three of his evil lords. Envy, Greed, and Wrath patrolling the first, second, and third floor as a favor to Sheltier who had ventured out on this night with two of her brides to feed. Not from Crane Village, no, but from another village that was probably 20 miles east of northeast to find on a few unlucky settlers. But to be perfectly honest Sheltier was far from his mind truthfully. In truth it was his mistress. Lady Mimoga that occupied his thoughts. She had been locked up in her quarters and by extension the lower levels for several days. It had a lot to do with Lord Yuzukic. While love was a foreign concept to demons such as himself, the art of mating was not. Albedo and her sisters were the types of demons who could fall in love. Since he rarely interacted with the other two sisters, he didn't know if they were Sakubi or not, but from the way Albedo reacted to the touches of the Lord and Lady, he was fairly sure that she had been chosen as breeding stock for Lord Yuzukic. And unlike Lady Mimoga that was all she would be a warm body for their lords to sate their lust. Of course that was all denizens of Nazark. They were there for the will of their lords. And that brought up another question. What was their Lady and Lord's will? Demiurge knew that they were deterred to protect the legacy of Ain Zulgaon. But there had to be more. Lord Yuzukic and Lady Mimoga can't just be content to hide away. No, it's not that simple Lord Yuzukic left a few days ago to look at a human village. What are they planning, the demon thought to himself. He stopped as he sensed a massive flow of mana. Coming from below. He waved his evil lords over and positioned them in a fighting position, ready for whatever it was. As he saw the person he felt a fool for not realizing that it was his lady. He gave the mantle order for his evil lords to stand down, before he fell to a knee with them following suit. Lady Mimoga, said Demirch. Demirch. What are you doing on the first floor? Asked Momoga. I am covering for Sheltier while she and her brides feed on a nearby human population. Of course with Sheltier being a Draculina her thirst must be quite powerful, said the demon. Lady Momoga put a chin on her hand. So that was why she requests to go out on that scouting mission. Sneaky little blood-sucking bitch. Pure you would be proud of her, thought a grinning Momoga. I authorize Sheltier and her brides to leave for the day. They had been looking a bit thirsty the last few days. A dead human or two isn't a problem in this world, light Momoga clear though her teeth. The demon wanted to ask why. To him it made little sense to have arguably the strongest floor guardian away from her post. Then again Lady Momoga was benevolent to those under her. Who was he to argue her decisions? Demiurge smiled. Always thinking of those under her. What an amazing woman you are Lady Momoga, said Demiurge. Momoga smiled. Thank you for your kind words, but I have matters to attend to, said Momoga as she took a step. Lady Momoga surely you don't plan to leave without a proper escort. Asked Demiurge out of concern for his mistress. That was the point of the disguise so that I may move freely without alerting everyone, said the Queen of Nazark. Then I insist you take no less than three guards with you for your protection, said Demiurge. Sana sighed in her mind. She had wanted to avoid this. Spend just one bloody hour alone outside the walls of Nazark. She knew that any attempt to leave without alerting the floor guardians or anyone from Nazark would end in disaster. An idea hit her. Clever as she was able to pull it off at all. That would be unwise. The defense of Nazark is our number one priority, even above minor Yuzukage's safety, however I will allow you to escort me out, said Momoga. Demiurge smiled. He quickly gave the mental command to his forces and left with Monaga. They walked out the halls in silence. Both lost in their own thoughts. Once they came to the entrance of Nazark Momoga raised her hand and used her authority as guildmaster to open the gates. Once out in the open Momoga admired the night sky. 
So clear a few clouds, but not the noxious one she was used to. No threat of black rain. No fear of poison should the sky open up. She closed her eyes and took a whiff of the air. Clean, beautiful air. Nothing like the rancid toxic air of her home dimension. This was beautiful. Reaching into her pocket dimension and took out a small wing crystal and put it around her neck. Fly, she said, as she became weightless. She took her staff and side mounted it as a witch in old stories, would and took off. Demiurge grew a large pair of leathery bat wings and followed his mistress. The duo soared several hundred feet into the air before stopping. A full moon was out tonight. Momoga stopped first and admired the moon. She reached her hand out and couldn't help but smirk. While the sixth floor had been Blue Planet's pet projects to see something of a restored world if only in a video game, this, nothing could beat the real thing. Yuzukich and Blue Planet had been good friends. Then again Blue Planet was an executive of Yuzumaki Industries, and worked closely with Yuzukich. Almost as closely as Buka Buka did. Lucky Bitch was part of their media games division as a voice actress. It didn't hurt that she was quite pretty Earl. But that was an old gripe. No this moment her thoughts were on the druid spirit. Blue Planet San. You would have loved this. I hope that you are continue your noble work to restore the planet, thought Momoga. The sky is so beautiful. It's on another level compared to the sixth floor, said Momoga. The stars in the sky are glittering like a box of jewels. I believe that this world shines so that my lady and lord might adorn yourselves with its riches, said Demiurge after he caught up to her. Momoga sauna snickered for a moment before she let out a laugh, loud and belly achingly so. It took a full minute for her to calm down. That may be so Demiurge. Yuzuki and I may have come to this land to obtain this box of treasures, said Momogasana with a fondness in her voice for Yuzukiji's name. The treasures of this world are not something we should hoard for ourselves. Perhaps this is so we can adore Nazirk and my comrades of Ainzul Gaon with it. Demirj bowed to his lady. If that is what Melody wished. We will use the forces of Nazirk to obtain it all for you and Lord Yuzukich. Momoga let out a light on ladylike snort as her grandmother would have called it. At this point we don't know what really exists out there, said Momoga taking a moment, before she looked up at the moon again, her eyes low and glowing slightly in the moonlight. But then again, taking over the world might be enjoyable. Momoga missed it with her back turned to him, but Demir just gasped. Sana shook her head. As if we could ever pull something like that off, thought the salary woman in her. Now he understood. Lord Yuzukich leaving on scouting missions. Sheltier being allowed to leave to feed. The shadows that had been sent out across the lands. It all made sense now. He had been too blind to understand his master and mistress's intent. But now he understood. He got it. Lady Momoga the guild master of Ainzul Gaon and Lord Yuzukich the frontline commander of Ainzul Gaon. The strongest magic caster and the strongest hand-to-hand -hand fighter. The Kitsune of Nine Tails and the Wrath of Beautiful Madness. The ultimate power couple. They had kept quiet about it until it was such a time to reveal it, but Demiurge knew what it was. Their secret. Lady Momoga and Lord Yuzukich were going to take over the world the cool night air was amazing. The gentle breeze brought it with its smells and sensations that she never smelt in the old world. There her senses of smell and ability to move and think beyond combat was limited. Forced. Here all her senses were unmuted. It made her want to scream and run in joy, unleash the true beast within. But she could wait. Raising her head she glanced at the large celestial body that was currently at its apex in the river of stars. The moon was high in the sky. Barely a day since the last full moon, but then again the moon was perfectly full three times a month. The Pusargina bade her lupus to her sisters stood watch in the courtyard that night. The beautiful werewolf of the Pleiades sisters. Lupus was a dark-skinned beauty stood at 5'7", and well not the bustiest with only a modest C-cup bust, compared to the likes of Yuri Alpha or Solution Epsilon of the sister she was the most athletically built, and red hair tied in two long braids. Wearing a modified mate uniform with short sleeves and long black gloves with a skirt that has a long slit on its left side, revealing thigh-high white stockings. She is equipped with an imposing black and silver scepter slung across her back. Lupus would be the first to admit that she was quite lazy and hated serving anyone who wasn't a supreme being. She even had a slight annoyance at serving the floor guardians, even though they were her direct superiors. No, it was more apt to say that the Pleiades sisters were the supreme being's personal attack force, specialized for the defense of the throne room. Of course that wasn't her current duty. Her current duty was to watch for Lord Yuzukich. He had been gone longer than expected. Lupus frowned at this. Lord Yuzukich in her mind as well as the others' minds was the perfect mate. His power was all-inspiring. His presence dominating, his personality and looks perfect. The fact that he was a spirit and a beast at that, set her loins on fire, and basically triggered her urge to mate and give him a litter of strong pups. But she couldn't be the first to give him pups. There was a pecking order at the moment. First was Lady Momoga. Regardless of if she knew it or not, she was practically eyeing Lord Yuzukich. Lopez was sure that they would end up matting soon. Next came Lady Albedo. The Sukbui was easily going to be Lord Yuzukich and Lady Momoga's bed warmer. Probably give them both at least three daughters if the rumors of Insecubi Queen getting pregnant by females as well as males was true. Next up was Lady Sheltier. That little lowly vampire. 
Lubis's hackles raised thinking of that little bitch. While she did respect the floor guardian, her seeming dislike was more incensed in her DNA than anything. Vampires and lichens the true name of her race, and not just the human feared term werewolf, were ancient enemies, streaming from the fact that at one point in their history, lichens were slaves to vampires. Lupus shook her head. This wasn't the time to revisit old rivalries. Outside of those three at the very top of the packing order, it would most likely be fair game. Of course she planned on giving Lord Yuzukic as many pups as he wanted. Lupus drew her weapon and swung it behind her, only for it to be caught between the forefinger and thumb of Lord Yuzukic, who was smiling at her. Lupus gasped in horror. She had attacked Lord Yuzukic. She quickly backpedaled and bowed. My lord. Please forgive me for attacking you. Yuzukic looked at Lupus with a smirk on his face. It's fine Lupus. You didn't realize that I had arrived until it was too late. I used one of my skills to appear as quickly as I did, said Yuzukic. Understood my lord. Lady Momoga told those on watch to report the moment you arrived. She also explained that you were to report to her quarters the moment you returned, said Lupus. Izukic nodded as he reached into his pocket dimension and summoned his ring to his finger, before teleporting to the ninth floor. Location. Tomb of Nazrik. Place. Tenth floor Momoga's room. Time. Late evening. Momoga was in her quarters looking at herself in the mirror. She fixed her hair as best she could, and lifted herself in the black and purple cocktail dress, with the slit up the side that went way past her hip. The necklace of Morgona which normally increased her magical output by 40%, but here it made a good accessory and a pair of stiletto heels. She had sprayed herself with a succubus perfume that would enhance her intended target's desire. Everything was perfect, except that she was nervous about what would happen. Taking a breeze she raised her right hand and pointed it at the mirror. Ardor enchantment maximum, said Momoga. The spell hit the mirror and rebounded on herself. It hit Momoga between the eyes, and made her eyes gain a pink hue. In Idrasil the spell gave a physical and magical buff to male or female characters if they were hit with it. The flavor text of the spell said that people gained a powerful desire to be with the person they love. The mirror that she used was the mirror of her eyes. A common magical item that allowed people to narrow down the location of uncommon resources for item crafting or potions. Here it showed one their heart's desire, and gave a magical enhancement to spells and items of love lust, if they planned on trying to get what they're intended. Well Momoga planned on taking a fox tonight. A knock sounded on her chamber door. Vanishing the mirror she walked over to the chamber doors, the clicking of her heels echoing throughout the chamber. She grasped the handle and opened the door to find Yuzukic there. You wanted to see me Mo, started Yuzukic only for his lips to dry up. Momoga. Momoga pulled Yuzukic into the room and closed the door as she pushed her large breasts against his chest. Momoga. Yelled Yuzukic. Momo, Sana put her finger to Yuzu, Naruto's lips. Tonight I don't want the frontline commander of Ainzul gown, I don't want the lord of nine tails, I don't want the CEO of Yuzumaki in the stars. I want the man who is my best friend, the man who I love. I Suzuki Sana want you Yuzumaki Naruto, said Sana. Naruto growled at Sana and picked her up by her thighs and hosted her into the air. If I take you. Here and now Sana, no one else will have you. I'm going to break you tonight, I'm going to you, and then I'm going to make love to you in such a way that you won't forget what I do to you, said Naruto. Sana leaned in and said the words that sealed her fate. Then do it my love, said Sana. Suzuki Sana didn't know how many times she had orgasmed from the number of times and ways Naruto had taken her, and not only kumin her, but noted the entrance to her womb shirt. No matter how many times and ways she rode him to completion revealing in the feeling. They had started out rough and violent allowing their avatars, former avatars desires to bleed into their desire. Izukage's desire to breed every female he made it with and Momoga's desire to dominate and to a lesser extent be dominated and birth several daughters. Near the end their lust had weaned and they had made love. Slow tender passionate. They had kissed each other, their lips staying together until their lungs burned with the need for oxygen. Time had become lost to their minutes, hours, days. They didn't know, all they knew was in the end they were complete. Sana snuggled up to Naruto in the bed. Her room was a complete mess and looked like they had gone about 20 rounds, which wasn't too far from the truth. Oh that was amazing. Kut Sana. You were amazing Sana-chan. Where did all that come from? Asked Naruto. Sana chuckled and managed with a very pleasant soreness that went from her core to her entire body, to climb atop Naruto and rock her womanhood dripping with copious amounts of their combined fluids, over his still hard cock. You don't know how long I've wanted to do that, my lord, said Sana. Naruto chuckled and grabbed her hips. I can only imagine. The feeling were there I think we were both too scared to allow them to manifest. Hell might as well skip the wedding and declare ourselves married, said Naruto. Only for you lord, said Sana with a smirk on her face. Sana learned down and kissed Naruto, not like one of their many passion-filled one that had. This one was tender, loving. Like their first kiss of that evening. It conveyed everything that she was feeling. Love, a concept that should have been forged into her as a wraith that demon from the underworld. When we were human that might have been it. That we had then on that day was nothing but two lonely souls who needed an outlet. Here as we are, I'm not allowing you to go. You are mine lord Nazarek. 
You can have as many lovers as you want, but you belong to me as both Naruto and Yuzukich, said Momoga. Yuzukich nodded. I'm glad, but I'm telling you now I'm not as nice about sharing you with other men. Women are one thing, but no other man can lay with you, said Yuzukich. Momoga smirked. That's fine. I never planned on laying with another man. Women though, well I do like how Sheltier and her brides play, said Momoga. Yuzukich growled hearing this, before he flipped her over and they began to make love again. Location. Tomb of Nazark. Place. 9th floor throne room. Time. Early morning. The denizens of Nazark were gathered in the throne room as per the orders of the supreme beings. Albedo was on her knee at the head of all of the denizens of Nazark. Not long after Momoga and Yuzukich arrived. Momoga stopped before the throne, before taking a seat upon the right armrest, and crossed her legs as Naruto took the seat. Many members of the tomb of Nazark looked on his shock at this. As far as many of them knew, Momoga was the only person who had ever sat upon the throne. Muttering broke out throughout the hall at this turn of events. Momoga held up her hand making everyone go silent. Denizens of Nazark. I understand that this is a bit strange, but I have come to a decision as the former ruler of Nazark. I will allow my lord Nazark to explain. Yuzuki chuckled at this. Thank you Lady Nazark. As of today there is no one true ruler of the tomb of Nazark or the former guild Ain Zulgaon, rather Momoga, and I now share that responsibility. We are no longer just Momoga and Yuzukich, but Yuzukich Nazarik and Momoga Nazarik, husband and wife. Seeing as this has happened I'll soon be advocating my former duties as the frontline commander to someone else. In fact soon the positions that were around in Yggdrasil will be reworked and remade. That will be discussed at length with the floor guardians in a separate meeting, said Yuzukich. Albedo stood up and approached the throne. We creations of the supreme beings have heard your decree Lord Nazarik. Lady Nazarik we have heard your wishes, and we will fulfill all aspects of what you need us to do. All hail Lord and Lady Nazarik. Yelled everyone in the throne room. Yiranto was considered a good location for copper to gold ranked adventurers. Of course, the odd platinum and even mitral ranked adventurers the bottom floor of the bar wasn't packed by any means, but it wasn't empty either. With 20 or so people, majority of them being iron ranked with the odd silver and gold ranked adventurer mixed in. The door opened up prompting everyone to look at the people who opened the door. Standing there were four people. On the outer left side was a young woman with long braided red hair, dark skinned, and a supple figure, however it was her eyes that drew you and trapped you in her gaze. She wore a bronze overbust corset with a vertical strip of lighter brown in the center, skin tight black leather pants, and a cap over her head. Behind her back was a large black and silver scepter. 1. Standing on the outer right side was a beauty that was equal to the red head, but for different reasons. She has elegant, snow-white skinned, black ponytailed beauty wearing a white blouse that made her chest stand out slightly, brown pants tucked into black boots, a red cape and a simple brown belt. Her weapon was a simple gladiolus sword. On the inner left side of the group was, a princess, not goddess among ordinary women. Sure the other two were beautiful, but she made the other two look plain by comparison. She had skin that was a few shades lighter, than the red-haired woman, and shimmering black hair that reached her waist, wearing a revealing set of robes that gave a good view of her breasts, and had slits up her right leg stopping at her hip, thigh-high boots with a golden trim, a large pointed purple hat with hat with a gold band around it, two leather belts that crisscrossed on her white hips, and a wooden staff made from elder wood with a red orb in the center. Finally was the only man of the group. He was tall, but not overly so, his hair was long enough to reach the middle of his back, and was as red as the woman on the outermost left. A sister or distant cousin perhaps, as his skin was more of a peach, he wore a white kimono with a red and white cherry blossom flower crest at the collar and sleeves. The white sash Niki Hakama which are gathered at the ankles long yellow flowing sash with violet detail over this he wore a black and silver armor. Includes a spiked pauldron that covers his left shoulder, attached by red ropes to the upper section of his black cuirass, with lotus petal faults that possess light grey trim. His weapon seemed to be one of eastern influence. The katana of many of the more experienced adventurers recalled. The sheath looked runic in design as did the hilt. Aside from that the blade seemed to radiate an aura of its own. 2. Aside from the power this group seemed to have and the high value equipment which probably marked them as bored nobles, the only thing that held them back was the fact that they were all copper plates. The lowest of the low ranked adventures. The male of the group walks forward down to the innkeeper. The red haired man smiled. Good morning sir. My companions and I would like a room, said the red haired man. We have a few rooms here, but not many with more than two beds. The only room with four beds has already been picked up by a group of gold plates for the next month, said the keeper. That's fine, said the red-haired woman as she jumped onto the red-haired man's back. Naisama and I can consummate our love anywhere we want. 3. The red-haired man blushed. Emoto please we are in polite company, said the red-haired man. The dark-haired beauty sighed as she grabbed the ear of the red-haired woman making her squeal. Please stop this nonsense Regina-sama. It is unbecoming of your position and doesn't reflect on his lordship very well. The now named Regina turned and stuck her challenge out at the black haired woman. The keeper looked between the two. You two siblings are something. Asked the keeper. The witch gave a small laugh. Something of the sort. 
She is a member of my beloved's clan, said the witch. The keeper nodded being quite familiar with this type of thing. Cousins who were really lovers, siblings who couldn't be together due to family. Hell he had even encountered a mother and son who were in love and had a child on the way. That was just the way of the world he guessed. That will be 15 silver or 3 gold for 5 nights. Dinner is included, but if you want breakfast or lunch that's an extra 2 gold, said the keeper. The red haired man nodded and placed the 3 gold on bar. The room is all we need, said the man. The keeper nodded. Second floor, fifth door on the left, said the keeper. The group turned to the stairs and began to walk to the stairs, only to be stopped as the iron plate put his foot out in front of the group. Regina narrowed her beautiful eyes. What's the big idea putting your feet in front of Naisama? The man smirked at Regina. I apologize little lady, but your Naisama has quite a bit of gold. I'm sure he can spare some for his superiors, but if not he can share your girls with us. I'm sure you don't need all that company, said the man. The red-haired man narrowed his eyes, before he lashed out with his hand and grabbed the man before lifting him up high into the air. Despite his looks, the red-haired man was all muscle. His purple eyes glowed an eerie and deadly blood red. Never threatened to take from me. Yelled the man unleashed a burst of ore, before throwing the man away. A young woman in her twentieth summer of life was content to ignore the group. Untidy red hair trimmed short for easy movement in combat. Although her features aren't bad and her blue eyes are as sharp as her sword, her skin is weak-colored after long exposure to the sun. Wearing low-grade leather armor. This woman was Brita, an iron plate adventurer who freelanced as a ranger. She didn't really want to join up with the party, since female adventurers were oftentimes preyed upon by quite unsavory individuals. Brita had a reputation as being one of the few female adventurers that were quite strong among the low ranks. She herself thought that she was closer to a gold-ranked adventurer, but that was a guild chose. As the other iron plate adventurer slammed into her table she saw her hard work break right in front of her. What the hell? Yelled Brita as she stormed over to the red-haired man. The red-haired man looked at her and raised an eyebrow. Can I hate you? Asked the red-haired man. Brita began to shake in anger at this bastard's disrespect. You just destroyed my high-end healing potion. I had to skip meals and even stop drinking to afford that potion. Sevening gold pieces. You owe me. Growled out Brita. How dare you speak to Naisama that way. Growled Regina reaching for her. Easy Regina. I'm sure Ashi has this under control, said the witch. The red-haired man sighed, before he reached into his side pouch and pulled out a potion that was red in color. Brita snatched the potion and held it up. A red potion? Thought Brita. Are we good miss? Asked the now named Rashi. Yeah. For now. The cleric, two mages, and a samurai. Rare that we see anyone from the Eastern Conference here, said Brita pocketing the potion. Oh? You know where we come from? Asked Regina. Brita ran a hand through her hair. Yeah. Kinda hard to miss with those exotic looks. Regina and I come from a small collective of villages not associated with the EC. We prefer to work and train our own warriors. You wouldn't have heard of our villages before you ask, said Arashi. Rita raised a brow at this. I see. Well if you're in the market for a ranger don't hesitate to look me up. Name's Breeder. Arashi smiled. My name is Namakis Arashi. The red-haired girl is my little cousin and priestess from my home village Senju Regina. The dark-haired swordswoman is my family retainer Nablite. And finally the woman who is next to me is my fiancé Momo. We are the party Stormfront, said Arashi. Rita nodded and looked at her new potion again, before walking away. Stormfront retired to their room. It was a small affair with a single desk and two twin-size beds. Sana took a seat at the only chair in the room, Regina and Nate both sat on the bed as Rashi leaned on the bed. Momo raised her hand making it glow. Barrier, magic detect, repulse sight, sense enemy, death. There, now no one outside of this room will be aware of what we get up to, unless they can break fifth tear magic, said Momoga. Yuzukic nodded. Then we have a moment to let our hair down and think. We also really need to go over all the operations we currently have in place, said Yuzukic. Momoga nodded. Very well then, my lord husband, said Momoga getting up and kissing Yuzukic on the neck. Naruto Yuzukic didn't even blush at this point in time. After a month of marriage to the woman he had become used to her teasing. Regardless of everything they did together. The amount of the two had when they were not busy was actually pretty insane. He was actually surprised in a way that he hadn't put a baby in her albedo yet. Oh that was another thing that had happened. Momoga Sana had basically made it open invite to Naruto's bed when she couldn't take care of his needs. Honestly Naruto was about 50% sure that this was due to the fact that she had a few classes in succubus, and 50% sure that this had to, due to the fact that one of her best friends was a huge pervert. Have you not seen Sheltier? But that was neither here nor there. First we have Sheil on a long-term undercover mission inside of the Empire. The only way she could return is upon either death or one of the memory triggers is activated, that would spell imitate danger to Nazark. Second we have Sibas and Solution out and about acting as a traveling noblewoman and her servant. Third Kwakita says the new frontline commander as you appointed him is looking into the demi-humans and lizardmen. Three operations that you created, said Momoga. Yuzukic nodded. You have two operations going on at this time. 
You have demiages working on obtaining materials for scrolls as well as ink, or is in the tracking something that has the creatures inside on edge, said Yuzukich. We have our own mission to complete. Lopas Regina, Naro. What are our goals? Asked Momoga. We are to collect information and earn renown, said Lopas. We are also to earn the currency that is used in this world to supplement our own treasures inside of Nazarek, said Nade. Correct, said Yuzukich as he took his sword and off and laid on the bed. Get some rest. We will go to the guild and get a quest first thing in the morning. That makes sense, except for one thing Lord Yuzukich, Lady Momoga, said Nabral bound to her lord and lady. It's Arashi. And it Momo Nabe. And you don't have to call me Lord Arashi, said Yuzukich Arashi. Of course, lo, Arashi-san, said Nabe. The three women with him nodded in agreement and went to lay down themselves. Location. The rental. Place. Adventurers Guild. Time. Afternoon. When the group entered the guild Arashi noticed several people looking at them. Apparently word had spread fast about what had happened in the inn, and several people were praising them. Judging them. The gold and platinum were judging their worth. Let them judge. None of them were even strong enough to handle the likes of neighbor Regina. Momo walked up to the notice board and frowned at how unorganized it was. This was most likely the salary woman in her who spent days on end organizing papers. She quickly read over the information of the quest, and realized that the system they had set up had copper plates doing things like goblin exterminations, slime removals and the like. Nothing that was even worthy of them. Well Momo-chan? Asked Rashi. Momo shook her head. None of these are worthy of us beloved, said Momo. Regina put her hands behind her head. Now you saw this sucks. Can we just take the strongest quest and be done with it? Asked the frowning redhead. Hey girly I suggest you keep your lips shut. Your auric is and barely worthy of taking those low class quests, said a gold plate adventurer. Nade frowned. Worm. How dare you insult my lord. Arashi waved it off. It's fine Nade. They don't know us, said Arashi. Millward. Asked Nabe. Arashi smiled. Sorry if our comments offended you. You see, my group is actually a lot stronger than we appear. To most of you we are rookies, however that is far from the case. Vegina here has cult spirits that with the equivalent of platinum plates. Nade can use upwards of tier 5 magic with ease same with Momo here. And I'm strong enough to have killed a demon lord in my home village solo, said Arashi. Several people looked at them in shock, only for a platinum ranked adventurer to slam his drink onto the table, getting the attention of everyone. He was very tall and muscular and wore armor befitting of his plate. He was missing his left eye, and his hair was spiky. A seasoned warrior if anything. What a load of hot trash. Yelled the man. Several people moved backwards as he spoke. A heavyweight within the adventurer's community it seemed. A silver plate adventurer came over. He was pretty small. He had a magic staff and short brown hair. Sir I advise you to not anger him anymore. He is George Leon. He is as strong as a mithril plate adventurer, said the young man. Thank you for the warning, said Arashi as he stepped forward making many people form a circle around the table, and where Arashi stood. Mr. Leon can I ask what seems to be the problem? Asked Arashi. Leon snorted. A wet behind the ears punk and his three bitches coming into my town, and thinking they're better than anyone else. Honestly you're not even fit to lick my boots clean. Arashi closed his eyes. I see. You think that just because you don't know of us we are making our stories up, said Arashi, as he slightly opened his eye enough to give off an intimidating oar. That's what I'm saying you rich little prick. As he got up and brandished his mace at them. With members of his party getting their swords ready. Regina and Nabe got in front of Arashi preparing to draw their own weapons. Momo raised her staff, and Arashi's hand flew to his katana. Mr. Leon, no need for that, came another adventurer. A silver plate. Get out of my way Peter else. Growled Leon. Leon sent, came a voice that stopped everyone in their tracks. Leon turned and looked at the older man who stood at the desk. Guildmaster, said Leon. I've already put sanctions against you and your party before. Don't make me do it again, said the man. Leon glared at the guild master, before putting away his mace and sitting down, but not before throwing one last glare at Arashi. The girls threw their own glares at Leon, before turning back to the man who stepped between them. Peter had the features of a commoner of the Riestai's kingdom. Blonde hair and blue eyes. Unremarkable face, wearing leather and chainmail armor. He put a hand over his heart and lowered his head. A common greeting in Riestai's kingdom. Arashi returned the greeting. Good afternoon. I am Peter Mock, leader of the Swords of Darkness party, and I'd like you to accompany us on a quest, said Peter raising up and smiling. Oh? Is that so Peter San? Asked Momo with a glint to her eyes. Please hear me and my party out, said Peter. Arashi looked at Momo who just nodded, while Regina smiled and Nate just blinked in confusion. Arashi turned back to Peter. Very well Peter San. We will hear you out, said Arashi. Peter's smile seemed to become even brighter. Thank you Mr. Tashi. I promise you and your party won't regret it, said Peter. My lord better not or you'll pay for it with your life, said Nate. Regina waved her hand. Chill out Nate chan It's not that bad, said Regina. Momo looked at everything with a smile, but behind that smile was a calculating mind. Just how valuable was Peter and his party she wondered. 
Ninya hadn't once looked away from the ethereal beauty of Arashi. He was tall, he was good-looking and he was powerful. While Ninya didn't have the gift of magical sight, she was pretty good at being able to tell how powerful someone was. There was a theory in the magical power of a person determined how the attractive potential mates to them. Judging by the beauty and seemingly powerful female companions, then Arashi must have a significant amount of power. Not to mention, all of the women in his group were beautiful. Each of them could rival the beauty of Lacus Alvain de Lindra, leader of the all-female adamantite tranked adventurer group, the Blue Roses. Ninya could never compare to them. Female adventurers were rare as it stood. Some groups that had female adventurers were because the female was dating a member, or she could have been sleeping with all of the male members of said group. It was why Ninya hid her identity as a female from her comrades. She didn't want to cause conflict, especially the fact that she had a bit of a crush on their leader, and their lustful ranger would be hitting on her and asking for non-stop. Currently the Swords of Darkness and Team Namikas were in a meeting. Allow me to formally introduce myself and my team. My name is Peter Mok, I am a warrior. To my immediate left is Dying Woodwonder. He is a druid, said Peter. May Mother Gaia bless your party and protect you my new friends, said the large well-groomed blonde man. To his left is Ninya. He is our magic caster. He can cast up to second tier magic, said Peter. Ninya blushed. A pleased to met you all, said the young man. Peter sighed. And finally to my to my right is our ranger and scout. Luck Revolve. Luck Revolve smiled as he waved at the women. Hello my lovely ladies. It is a pleasure to meet you all. If you need someone to help you with anything then I am here for you, said Luck Revolve, winking at the ladies. Nabe frowned at this fool. How dare this worm even think he could compare to Lord Arashi. Silence worm, you don't even compare to the greatness that is Lord Arashi, said Nabe not even looking at Luck Revolve. Regina gave a small smile. Please continue to annoy me. I'll take you out like the bitch you are, said Regina. Luck Revolve threw his head back. Oh such harsh words from such beautiful maidens, said Luckert. Peter smiled, before elbowing his comrade. Sorry about him Lord Arashi, said Peter. Arashi raised his hand. Please Arashi is fine, but please get your friend under control. Nabe and Regina will kill him if he can't he's to annoy them. They are normally quite docile. However my friends and I are protective of each other, said Arashi. Peter nodded. Understood, said Peter glaring at Luckert. Then allow me to return the favor. My name is Arashi and I am an assassin with some sage training. The red-haired girl is my half-sister Regina, and she is a cleric. Next is my, I guess you would call her my childhood friend and retainer to my family Nabe. She is a spellcaster who can use upwards of tier 3 magic. And my lover Momo can use tier 4 magic, said Arashi. Ninya's eyes widened. Tier 4 magic. But even the best adventurers can barely use tier 5, and they've been at it for years, said the disguised female. Momo winked at Ninya. Believe it or not I didn't start off that strong. It took a lot of hard years and harsh training for me to be able to use 4th tier spells with any effectiveness, said Momo. Anyway what are we currently doing for the guild? Asked Arashi. We taking a trip though the southern routes. Goblins as well as some forest trolls have been making things difficult for the farming villages and trading caravans, said Peter. An extermination mission? Asked Arashi. Not really. From time to time the guild needs adventurers to go out and handle rouge monsters and bandits. I personally try to keep out of the way of bandits, since killing humans is distasteful to me, said Peter. Momo narrowed her eyes. Humans. Does that mean that you have no problem killing beast minerals? Asked Momo. Peter and the other members of the Swords of Darkness all winced at her accusation. Before Peter could answer the guild lady walked up and gave a bow to Arashi. I apologize Lord Arashi, but someone wishes to see you, said the woman. Arashi and the others looked over to where everyone was gasping and looking at the person. A young teenage boy with short bull cut blonde hair that covers half his face. He is dressed in ragged work clothes with a tan apron. The Swords of Darkness looked at the young man with reverence. Inferior Bear. Yelled the group. Who? Asked Regina. Inferior is a well-known potioner in e rental, said Peter. He also has the gift of being able to use any magical item, regardless of its level. Arashi and Momo looked at each other. They needed to keep an eye on him. Inferior joined them at their table. He bowed to them. Hello, Arashi-sama. I am Inferior Bear. I'm wanting to contract you and your party for an escort mission to Yerentel, said Inferior. Is that so? Asked Momo. Inferior looked at the beautiful woman and nodded. Yes it is. And why would you want to hire a random group of no-name adventurers to escort you? Asked Momo closing one eye and looking at Nefer. Nefer smiled. You're smarter than I anticipated, said Nefer. Momo leaned back. I can't help but to feel insulted and praised at the same time, said Momo. Please don't be. Information from the East is scared best and downright rumored it's worst. It's actually rare that I or anyone here get a chance to speak with those from the Eastern Conference, and news travels fast in this city. I actually wanted to see if you had any different potions that I might be able to study and replicate on the trip, said Nefer. I see. While it is a bit underhanded to try and trick us we can understand it, however we won't be able to do it, as we have already accepted a contract to help the Swords of Darkness, said Arashi. 
Actually Nifrice and we will be heading down in that direction, and it's not too much trouble to handle your request, said Peter. Arashi looked to Peter, but shrugged his shoulders. Normally he would have rejected that suggestion outright, even if it was for his benefit, but it was best to allow this to play out. No need to say otherwise. Although he would have to put Peter in his place if he thought that it was a good idea to pull rank on his party. Let's get going, said Regina throwing a fist in the air. Location. Path leading to Kane Village. Place. Road. Time. Late noon, Regina walked several feet in front of Nefer, and his buggy with Momo sitting next to Nefer in the front nave and Lukrit were on the left side of the buggy, Peter and Dine were on the right side, while Arashi and Ninya brought up the rear. Normally Lukrit would have been up front since he was a scout, but Arashi had fought this, claiming that Regina's tracking skills were much higher than Lukrit's. Peter had accepted this and allowed her to take point. The reason that Momo was in the buggy was because she was using a spell that would protect the buggy from projectiles of non-magical property. Rocks and arrows, even with fire, would be next to useless and not hard to fare. As they walked Ninya kept stealing glances at Arashi. She couldn't help herself, his beauty was mesmerizing. He wouldn't have anything to do with her. Not only did she cut her hair short like a male's, but she wasn't that impressive under her clothes. Not to mention she was a virgin. Never having been touched by a man, let alone one as handsome as he who had his choice of three magnanimous beauties at his beck and call. Is something the matter Ninya-san? Asked Arashi. Ninya blushed. Nothing Lord Arashi, said Ninya. Arashi chuckled. Please Arashi is fine. Lord Arashi is just a title that the vessels of my home use. Personally I've never truly been one for form lights, said Arashi. Forgive me, said Ninya. Arashi frowned, before his hand went to one of his swords, and quickly drew it and thrust it in Ninya's direction. The blade went past her head and into the open maw of a large snake that it attacked out of nowhere. Ninya was shaking as she looked at the massive snake, before falling to her butt. The snake was easily as long as the horse and cart combated, and was as white as Ninya was. Arashi removed his blade from the maw, flicked the blood off and resheathed his blade. The fair stopped the cart as the others rounded on the location where the snake was. Luckard and Dai next in the snake. I'm sorry that I didn't detect this snake Ninya, said Luckard. How is something so big able to sneak up on us? Asked Dai. Naisama. Yield Regina. To her left. Regina drew her large club as Nate drew her sword. The others looked in the direction that they said. In the field to their left at the edge of the tree lines, was a small horde of rabbit goblins, easily one hundred in number, seven forest trolls, and an orc mage. That explained the silent snake. Momo, Ninya, Nabe Long Range Support, Peter watch our blind side, Dian Lucker protect Nefer Regina, and I will take the fight to them. Our primary target is the orc mage as he seems to be the one calling the shots, said Arashi drawing his two swords. Right, said the others. Flash Blossom, yelled Arashi as he vanished. 1. Ninya was in awe as twenty of the horde were all decapitated in less than a second. She didn't have time to admire his work as Momo and Nate both unleashed Chain Lightning. The effect of unleashing Twin Chain Lightning cream Chain Strom, taking out two of the forest trolls, but with the after effect of the multi-lightning, it took out several of the goblins. Regina raised her mace and bashed the head of the troll, before spinning around and gripping the face of the goblin, an impressive display of strength at Bellator's size, she crushed its head. She looked at her hand and grinned in a way that made Ninya think of a beast. Of course the Swords of Darkness were not passive in the fight. Dying used his druid magic and toppled a troll. Luckard used his bow and arrows to kill several of the goblins. Peter proved that he wasn't just some pretty boy with his sword and shield, and managed to get a boy count of eight for himself. Within moments the horde was reduced to a mere fraction of itself. The orc growled and glowed out something as the remaining trolls and goblins. Arashi frowned and raised his fingers up before him. You will not escape this battlefield alive. Ye lord. Mask of blood and flesh, all creation, flutter of wings, ye who bears the name of man. Inferno and pandemonium, the sea barrier surges, march on to the south. Shakam yelled Arashi as red energy covered his hand. 2. Thrusting his hand forward, Arashi unleashed a red massive condensed energy beam that caught everything in its wake, leaving nothing. Ninya, no Cilicia Varen felt her loins flare as she looked at the power of the man before her. 3. Location. Route to Kane Village. Place. Several hundred feet off the main road. Time. Late evening. After the battle the group decided to travel a few more hours before stopping to make camp. Lukrit, Regina, and Dine went to gather firewood. Nabe, Nia and Momo set up a defensive perimeter, while Arashi, Peter, and Nefera prepared dinner. As the group sat down to eat the group began to discuss things about themselves. Arashi learned that the Swords of Darkness were named after the legendary blades of one of the thirteen heroes. A hero who was said to have four blades of the darkest black. It had actually been Ninya who had named them. Ninya blushed as they teased her. Well now that you've heard about us how about you tell us about yourselves, said Peter. Yes I'm curious about the skills you displayed during battle. Especially that last attack, said Dain rubbing his beard. Arashi sat down his bowl and wiped his mouth. My name is Namakas Arashi. I am the son of the lord of my lands and heir to the title of lord of flames. I was also titled as the frontline commander for the army. 
I've seen battle and I've nearly lost my life several times, said Arashi. I can vouch for that, said Momo. We actually met on the battlefield. I is a mercenary that was hired by the Hokage, the Lord of Flames. Naisama is a hero in the Eastern Conference. He placated an evil noble, stopped an attack from a demon, and even fought a terrorist group that was attacking the nations for their own version of peace, said Regina. What about the spell you used? Asked Ninya. I've never seen such a destructive attack spell before. The spell I use was actually one of the weaker ones that my people use. Those spells I use are treasures among only the royal family. Every guardian and member of the temple is taught how to use Hado and Bakudo spells. The way of destruction and the way binding of binding. After serving as the frontline commander for a number of years, I begged my father to allow me to travel and grow as a person. He agreed under the condition that should he ever summon me I return immediately. I asked that my sister has illegitimate child come with me as well as my childhood mate and guard. He agreed. Momo never had to come with me, but she was a mercenary, and she goes where she pleases. It doesn't hurt that we became lovers during her time serving as part of my forces. That was almost five months ago, said Arashi. Before that I was part of a group of warriors who were some of the strongest in the world. People who I could depend on and loved as if they were family, said Momo in a bit of a somber tone. Ninya looked at Momo. Please cheer up Miss Momo I'm sure that you'll get to meet them again someday. That is not possible. All of them aside from Arashi have left this world behind, said Momo as she sat her bowl down and excused herself. Arashi sighed. I will go and speak to her, said Arashi. Arashi Yuzukich found Momoga sitting on a rock and looking at the stars. He joined her and placed a hand on her shoulder. She reached a hand up and placed it on his. No words needed to be said between the two as they understood what the other was thinking. Ninya woke with a start. Something had tripped her magical defense line. She looked around the camp. The others were still asleep. At least her party was. Nefiria was in the back of his wagon. Momo was sleeping on her side with a pillow under her head, and Nabe was curled next to her snoring lightly. Looking around she didn't see Arashi or Regina anywhere. Grabbing her staff she got up and walked to the location where the perimeter line had been tripped. She walked down to where the river edge were the small pond where they had gathered water the previous day. Wanna masking, stealth walk, said Ninyo as she felt what was a rush of cold water over her head. She knew that it worked. She began to creep slowly down to where she felt the magical signature of Regina. While it wasn't a powerful skill like Mage Sight, Ninyo had invested the time and effort into being able to detect mana signatures or meeting people. It was a skill that not even Peter knew about. Something that she used as a trump card. As she got closer to edge of the river, her ears picked up the groaning of pleasure. No her ears had to be deceiving her. There was a small rock formation where the sound was coming from, getting closer she moved around the formation just enough to where part of her head would have been visible, if her spell wore off, but that's to how dark it was, it would be nearly impossible to see her. Ninya's eyes widened at what she saw though. Arashi sat on the boulders that looked almost thrown like in the way they were arranged. His armor, kimono top, and sword were on the side, his pants were lowered only slightly past his groin, allowing her to get a good look at his massive penis, it was easily as large as her three of her fingers, and as long as dot. He was much larger, than Luckert who Ninya had to admit was quite blessed in the lower department. But that wasn't the thing that really caught her eye. The mocha-skinned, red-haired goddess Regina, was naked as the day she was born, with her long tongue worshipping Rashi's penis with her licks and kiss to the crown. She even used one head to fondle his large testicles, while her other hand was furiously working two fingers inside of her lower pretty pink lips. Her arousal was dripping down her inner thighs. Before long the dark-skinned earthbound goddess got up from her worshipping of the large tool before getting up above her cousin, and lowering herself onto it. She gave a throaty moan that would take nice Seely to places she never had been in her dreams before. Ninya the adventurer gave way to Cilicia Varen the woman as her own finger dipped low into her lower lips. Celia imagined that she was the one worshipping that large pea, cock with her mouth, even though she had never been taken by a man before surely Rashi would appreciate her enthusiasm and eagerness, just like he appreciated Momo's skills. She imaged that Rashi would throw her upon his kimono and take her most valued gift, slowly at first, before increasing his tempo, teaching her how a woman would please a man and vice versa. She imaged that he would fill her with his seed, impregnating her in that instant, and giving her a powerful child. Celia's hand shot to her mouth as she came from her foolish imagination. Her legs shook with the force of a quick. Her legs gave out and she fell to the ground trying not to pant in exhaustion and give away her position. Sadly that was not the case. She looked up in time to see Rashi grab Regina's hips before slamming Regina down on his cock, and from Celie's vantage point had seated her. If his seed was as powerful as Celie expected, then surely Regina would be pregnant. Regina got off of her lover and returned to her knees to suck and clean off his cock. It was at that point that Arashi looked over to Ninya's hiding spot. Ninya's eyes widened, before she quickly used two non-verbal spells, and as quickly and quietly as she could return to the others. Her dreams that night would be filled with images of Arashi's penis and Regina's moans. Izukich grunted as Lupus pulled her mouth off of her master, allowing him to paint her mocha-colored skin. 
Yuzuki looked down at the naked Lupus who was using her hands to scoop his kum off her face and breasts, and lick it off her hands. You're an incurable slut you know that. Asked Yuzuki after Lupus kissed his cock and put it back into her master's pants. Only for you and Lady Momoga my master, said a smoking Lupus as she stood up, allowing any seed that was inside of her to slowly drip down. I'm shocked you didn't try and not me master. Don't you want to put a few of your kits in me? Yuzuki growled in the back of his throat. His instincts were raging at him to show this bitch in front of him who was the alpha by putting as many kits as she could carry. To seat her over and over again to break her mind until the only thing she was good for was for being a doll that lay on his bed too and get knocked up. However the more civilized and powerful part of his mind knew that now wasn't the time so using his will, he pushed the beast back into the corners of his mind. Wash yourself in the river and return to camp once you're decent. We don't need everyone knowing about what happened, said Yuzukic. Lopez bowed low, knowing that an alpha had just issued her an order. As you command my lord. Next morning, Peter looked over at where Ninya was inside. Sometimes he wondered what he saw in that girl. Yes Peter knew that Ninya was a girl. So the dying Luke however was the odd man out. For someone who fancied himself a woman's ideal man, he didn't quite see when there was a woman standing in his face. It was something of an open secret at this point, while well, they knew about her, they chose not to acknowledge it. She would come out to them when she was ready and not beforehand. But Lil Papier wouldn't lie and said that he didn't find her attractive, but as Luke's logic stated inter-team romances were something that could hurt them. Ninya san said Regina shaking the girl. Ninya groaned and opened her eyes. It took her a moment to realize who it was, and when she did her face turned to Tom Krad and she shot up. Were it not for Regina's reflexes their foreheads would have collided. Not that Regina would have been hurt. Ninya are you alright? Asked Rashi. Ninya looked at Rashi and nodded, but couldn't help but to try not think about the monster that was inside of his pants. She has seen each member of the swords naked at one point or another, and none of them even came close. If Rashi showed that thing off to a woman then that woman would be a bitch before him. We should get going. We should be at the village a little past noon, said Afiria. The group nodded at D took up the same formation they took the day before. As they walked Ninya couldn't help but keep sneaking glances at Arashi. She couldn't help herself. What did you do? Asked Momoga though her and Yuzukage's mental link. That girl is undressing you at the moment. I caught her peeking when Lupus decided to be a little naughty and asked me for a quirky last night, thought Yuzukage. A kinky, thought Momoga with a perverted blush on her face. Why didn't you ask me to join in? I would have, but because we're on a time-sensitive mission I had to make it quick. Last time we had we ended up being for nearly a week, thought Yuzukage. Touché. Still next time call me. I really wanted to eat Yukum out of one of our slut, thought Momoga, as Nefer talked to her about some magic. Damn it woman focus. Growled Yuzukage as he answered a question that Ninya asked. A question about his sword. There was a pause in their mental conversation as they spoke their respective conversations. Yuzukab with Ninya and Momoga with Nefer. I'm focused on the fact that you didn't me last night, teased Momoga. Not the point. I wanted to run something by you, thought Yuzukage getting serious while drawing the edge of his blade and explaining some of the runes to Ninya. What is it? Asked the sorceress in curiosity as she laughed at a joke that thought. We turn her to her cause. She already a strong mage, whets the harm in turning her into a demon, and putting her skills and power to use for ourselves and our goals. Thought Yuzukic. That and you want to turn her into another comdom has nothing to do with it. Asked a grinning Momoga. That's just a bonus, thought Yuzukic. What about the other swords of darkness? Asked Momoga. What about them? Asked Yuzukic. Momoga grinned. This was something that Naruto and Sana had noticed it a while ago, but they were starting to fill more and more into their race class. For the two of them it meant that they didn't really care about humans. Conversation stalled with the group for the rest of the trip to Crane Village. It was around midday when they arrived at what should have been the entrance to the village, only there was a tall wooden fence at the valley that entered the village. It wasn't anything that a determined bandit group couldn't get past, but it gave some semblance of protection. Is this the entrance to Crane? Asked Nabe looking over the crude and pitiful design. Yes it is, but the fence is new, said Ninu. Everyone were surrounded. Said Lucker drawing his short sword. The others quickly followed suit as goblins popped out from behind the main posts, as well as the tall grass. Unlike the feral goblins with their rusted blades and crude clubs, these goblins had an air of intelligence about them. They all wore a range of armor dot in total there were about 25 goblins. The goblin in full pate armor and a red bandana. In his hands was a great sword. Halt, you're entering the territory of Crane Village. Be friend or foe? Asked the goblin. Nefera raised his hands. I'm a friend of Crane Village. I trade potions and herbs here all the time, said Nefera. The goblins looked at each other and smiled. Hey one of you bums go and get the boss, said the lead goblin as he planted his sword in the ground. Personally I'd rather not fight, and those two are giving of an aura that tells me we'd be meet in seconds. Wise move goblin, said Rashi as his hand came off of his sword. The others followed suit as they all waited for this boss. It was only a minute or so later that the boss came and to the shock of Inferia and Yuzukich, it was Enri. Enri smiled at them. Inferior. Mr. Jujum it's alright Inferior is a friend, and I'm guessing this is his escort. 
And Farius smiled at Enri with a blush on his cheeks. Momo smiled at the two. Momo Momoga Sana while Enri was cute Momo Momoga Sana honestly didn't want Naruto to touch her, not because she thought her a threat or anything, but she was just so sugary sweet. She didn't want her trying to corrupt her Naruto-kan with ideals of morality. And Farius said when will we be returning to your rental? Asked Rashi. We're going to rest for a few days. Is there a reason Mr. Rashi? No reason. I figure that that could help train your new defense force, said Rashi. That would be much approach guy, said the Captain Goblin. The group would then lead into the village. Where plants were being formed in the back of the minds of Lord and Lady Nazarick for one of the Swords of Darkness. Many creatures that lived in the New World gave the figure that walked through the winding paths, large elder trees, and rivers. The figure was Orbella, the newly minted Grand Surveyor of Nazarick, as the Supreme Beings had named her during the restructuring of the Great Tomb. The Lord and Lady Nazarick had gone through and reorganized the entire structure of Nazarick. No longer were they simply floor guardians. They had jobs that needed to be done outside of Nazarick's walls, or walk through the great forest of Top with one of her breasts for protection. Fen, a large black holy wolf. She had been given the task by the lords to map out the area. It had taken her little time to map out most of the known forest. A little over two weeks. When it came to the more unknown parts of the forest things got interesting. She learned from several creatures that she spoke with. Thanks to her abilities as a beast tamer and a high tamer she was able to in a way speak to animals. The forest of Top was divided into five sections with several rulers. The giant of the east, the demon snake of the west, the great tree of the north, and the wise king were the most prominent. She still had to serve the area to the south, but that would be done in a day or two. All in all, it had been a pretty good expedition for the dark elf. Putting her hands behind her head she smirked. I wonder what Lord Arashi and Lady Momoga are up to at the moment. Location. Crane Village. Place. Village Square. Time. Late morning, Ninya yawned as she walked from the guest residence where the two teams were staying at. She had awoken only a few moments ago. This was the fourth day that the two groups had been inside the village. Not only when the Swords of Darkness got to a village because of a request they would hurry back to E-Rental to take a day's rest and get ready for their next quest. However since they were working with the Rashi's group and were escorting Neferia back and forth, they decided to take it easy for a few days. While Neferia was working in the area, the two groups were relaxing, or at least that was the plan. H-H-H-H-H. Ninya sighed as she went to where the scrolling came from. She walked around the corner to find Arashi sparing with Peter and Luckert using wooden swords. The gaggle of village girls ranging from young teenage girls to unwedded women in their late twenties. Even some married women took an interest if their blushes were anything to go by. And who could blame them? Arashi, Peter, and Luckert were all shirtless. While Peter and Luckert were quite in shape their bodies were toned and tough from their respective fighting styles. Then there was Arashi. His muscles were toned to perfection. Well you could see some muscle on Luckert since he was more agile than Peter as a ranger, and had well-defined arms, but nothing on Peter whose entire fighting style was based around his sword swings. His arms and chest were much bigger than one would gather from the way he wore his armor. Arashi was different. While he wasn't as big as Peter, he was much more toned than either man. The muscles on his back were quite powerful, and he had a six-pack that you could cut diamonds on, and his arms were bundles of deafened steel wrapped tightly in elven silk. Look out and Peter both panted as sweat dripped off of them. Arashi stood still with the duo on either side of him. Arashi himself was only lightly sweating. Glad to see you here Ninya, said Momo from her perch on a fence. Miss Momo, how long have they been at it? Asked Ninya. Not long. About ten minutes, said Momo with a grin. Where is Miss Regina and Miss Snape? Asked Ninya. Neferia needed a guard while he went to gather herbs in the area. Mr. Dine went with them to act as part of the guard detail. Peter put both hands on his sword and charged at Arashi. The Eastern Lord raised his blade blocking the leader of the Swords of Darkness. Using his superior strength Arashi throw him away, but Luckert charged in and did a low slash at Arashi's feet. Arashi jumped into the air and kneed Luckert at the same time. He dipped backward making Peter miss his attack. Twisting in the air he thrust his blade outwards and into Peter's shoulder, sending him flying. Are you done? Asked Arashi planting the blade in the ground. Peter and Luckert were both panting as they rose to their feet. Not a chance. We want to beat you. We're going to take it up a notch, said Peter. Oh? This is going to be interesting, said Arashi. Martial art. Razor wind slash. Martial art. Speed slash. Arashi saw the telltale orange glow of the marital art as it was used. Peter went low as Luckert went high. Both men thought that they had Arashi, only for the man to twist his body out of the way of the two attacks, and smirk at the duo, as he extended his legs and kicked both men in their faces, and sent them flying. Both men hit the ground groaning. Are you done? Asked Arashi. We give up Lord Arashi, said Peter rolling onto his back and gasping for air. Arashi, smiled at the two men, before helping them to their feet. Several young men and women walk up to Arashi praising him. For his skulls and even asking him to teach them how to use the iron swords that they have. Arashi laughed at this and expressed that he had a free moment or two to instruct them in the basics of swordsmanship. 
as the young men, some goblins, and even some older men lined up to learn, Narashi looked over to Momo. Hey Momo, can you make some wooden swords for us? Asked Narashi. Momo chuckled. Sure. I have no problem doing as you ask my love, said Momo as she created several of the blades, and levitated them over to the people in the training camp. Narashi took his own and began with a basic stance that several people took. Ninya looked at the man who she knew that she was slowly falling into lust with. Maybe she was even starting to like him a little bit more than that. Location. Crane village. Place. Visitor house. Time. Late night. A small room the group was using as their temporary home while in Crane village reeked of sweat, and to those with powerful enough noses pheromones. While normally it would be foolish for the group to indulge themselves in the sin of pleasure, they truly needed it. Rashi and Momoga had put up a barrier to keep people away from their room, just for the chance to indulge themselves for a few hours. Momoga moaned as she rolled her hips atop Yuzukic in their shared bed. The duo was taking a moment to themselves in the middle of the night, even though Nabil and Lopas Regina were watching on the bed naked as the day they were born, kissing and pleasuring each other, awaiting their turn. So how goes your pet, ah, project with Ninya? Asked Momoga as Rashi hit a particularly sweet spot. Better than expected, grunted Naruto thrusting his hips upwards into his lover. Be too nice to that child Yuzukich-sama, moaned Lupas as she gripped Nabe's hair, forcing her sister's face deeper into her cunt. She's weak and has no real value to you or lady. Yuzukich grinned as he heard the red-haired she-wolf coom. He could admit to himself that he loved the creations of his friends dearly, but the arrogance of some of them grated on his nerves. Well he would have loved to break the alpha bitch as she referred to herself as he had more pleasurable things on his mind. Don't worry about her. She'll be accompanying me on a jaunt to the location of the wise king's location. Until then just enjoy the night, said Yuzukich. The group wouldn't be sleeping until the hours of dawn were upon them. Location. Great forest of top. Place. Forest floor. Time. Midday. Arashi and Ninya walked over the forest. Arashi had his hand on the hilt of his blade, while Ninya kept her staff at the ready. The duo were in the darkest, deepest parts of the forest, and would have to be careful of dire wolves, geists, and the like. Or at least that would normally be the case if not for the fact that Arashi was projecting his aura outwards keeping the beasts and weaklings away. Accompanying them was Aura, although she was under a cloak of invisibility. The duo stopped several meters outside of a cave. Ninya stepped back, said Arashi as he put a hand on his blade. Ninya did as told while Aura ran into the entrance of the cave and unleashed a small breath. That traveled though the cave until it hit its target. The target shivered in fear, before it roared and rushed out of the cave. The creature bounced around the trees for several minutes, before coming to a stop. Ninya backed up in fear. Arashi Naruto's eyes widened and was excited. Standing before the group was a Jingarian hamster that was about 8 feet tall with a snake-like segmented tail. The dares desert my slumber, said the figure. It it talks, said Ninya. My name is Namikaz Arashi. I am leader of the Namikaz adventuring group. I must admit it been some time since I've seen a hamster. The wise king looked at Arashi. You've seen one of my kind. Asked the wise king a hint of hope in its voice. Yes, my friend owned one, but it was much smaller than you are, said Arashi. The wise king deflated at this. Alas I have failed at my primary purpose in life. I guess I shall never be able to become a mother and pass on my abilities or wisdom, said the wise king. You're female. Asked Ninya and Arashi at the same time. That I am, but another matter that is. I will test you in combat. Yelled the wise king. The wise king got on all fours and whipped her tail at Arashi. The warrior moved his head out of the way of each strike. Arashi jumped into the air and snapped a branch off the tree, before jumping and slashing at the wise king, with enough force to nearly knock her out. I surrender to you. Yelled the wise king as she got to her knees and bowed. I will follow you as my master, that you are. Unreal you tamed the wise king of the forest with almost no, said Ninya. Arashi looked at her. I wonder, said Arashi as he reached into his pocket and pulled out an orange and black choker from his dimensional space. The choker was an item that came from a raid. It allowed one to not only turn a beast into a pet, but also allow them to take a human form. Arashi never managed to find a beat that he wanted to walk up to the wise king and put the collar around her neck. From this day forward your name is Makoto, said Arashi. Light sprang forth from the choker and engulfed the newly named Makoto. Makoto shrank from 8 feet tall to barely 5'2 with a body that was fit and curvous with large e-cup breasts, short brown hair, hazel eyes, and large breasts. She retained her long tail. Ninyu blushed as she looked at the girl before her. Yet another stunningly beautiful woman to compete against for Lord Arashia's attention. The fact that she was currently naked didn't help matters in her mind. 1. Makoto looked at her hands and tried to look at her behind, before she lost balance and fell on her butt, exposing her lower lips to Arashi. Arashi took off his cloak and put it around Makoto, before lifting her up in a bridal-style carry. Her arms incidentally came up and around his neck. Master my legs don't work. Arashi chuckled. It's fine. A friend of mine will be able to help you. For now we should return to the village and tell everyone that we tamed the wise king of the forest, said Arashi. Or I knew what her master meant. Report to Albedo and tell her everything that has happened. Or quickly departed as Rashi and Ninya returned to the village. Location. 
Crane Village. Place. Rental house. Time. Early evening. After introducing the Kodo to the others and Lukrit hitting on her, the group found out as much information about the changes to the forest and surrounding area. She was surprisingly well informed. Giving quite detailed information that was quite valuable to Yuzukij and Momoga. Even detailing the spike of energy that had put several powerful figures on alert. Momoga put a thumb in her mouth and bit her nail. This was one of the things that she feared. They had triggered some kind of alarm that they were there. While Nazarek itself hadn't shifted much or at all, it was still several hundreds of thousands of earth, metal, trees, ice, and other unnatural and natural materials alike. Such a huge move wouldn't go unnoticed. However, that gave her an idea. She would have to run it by Yuzukij, but for now, she would keep it to herself. Neferia put away his quill and ink and looked at his notes. Such information would make many scholars question what they knew about the last century. This is all very fascinating, but we should probably prepare ourselves to return to Irantil. We've been gone for over a week and need to report our success, said Nabe. She's right. We may need to clear another goblin troop on the way, said Peter. Nefira nodded. You're all right. Prepare to leave at first light. However, I would like to speak with Lord Arashi in private, said Nefira. Everyone looked at the duo, before leaving the room, with Makoto riding piggyback on Lupa's back. Once everyone was out Arashi raised his hand. Sound reduction, said Arashi. The barrier appeared air in it the room muffling anything that could be heard from the outside. Nefira was impressed. He knew the man could use powerful attack magic, but such subtle use of a spell like this spoke that he was quite skilled in magic. You wanted to get me alone. So please speak your mind, said Arashi taking a say cross from the younger man. The Lord Yuzukich, savior of Crane Village, said Nefira. Quick as a flash Nefira had a blade neck to his neck's neck. To his credit he didn't even flinch. How did you find out? Asked Yuzukic, not even trying to deny who he was. Reaching into his pocket he pulled out an empty vial. A veil that Yuzukic recognized as one of his potions vials. And we kept vial that you gave her. You also gave a vial to an iron-ranked adventurer back in Erantel, as a way of saying sorry. One person passing the god's blood potion I can understand, but two. That's quite a leap, said Nefira. Yuzukic curse. Now he would have to destroy the village to keep his secret. No one else knows. I'm the only person who knows who you are. Since you saved Crane Village and Enri, I will keep your secrecy Lord Yuzukich, said Nefir. Yuzukich took his blade away from Nefir's neck and sheathed it. Very well. This is something I keep close to my heart. If you reveal who I am and put my comrades in danger I will burn your entire world down, said Yuzukich. Nefir smiled. You don't have to worry Lord Yuzukich. I'll do everything in my power to protect those I love. Yuzukich looked at Nefir and smiled. I can respect your resolve, Nefir. Come, let us go. I'm sure the others are preparing a wonderful dinner, said Yuzukich. At that moment, the warrior king and the apothecary came to a mutual understanding and respect. Soon they would return to Irental, and maybe just maybe things would be alright. Thanks for watching.